little icons. And one of them looks a little bit like a globe and says interpretation. If you click on that, it pops up a menu that allows you to choose English or Spanish. We need everybody to choose their language. If you speak both, please choose one language that you'd like to communicate in during this portion of the meeting. Once you've chosen your language, the little globe should change to a little icon that either says EN for English or ES for Espanol. And I would like to remind presenters tonight that with interpreters, it's helpful to speak more slowly than you might speak if you were just speaking your native language. And especially true when you're reading something, we tend to speak more uh, quickly when we're reading. A good rule of thumb, which I need to remind myself of often, is to take a breath in between each sentence, especially if you're going over numbers and figures, which is likely during our COVID presentation. It's really helpful for our interpreters if you slow those numbers down just a little bit so that everybody can participate fully in this meeting. With that, I can turn it back over to you, Sam, and we can get started. Great. Thanks very much, Sarah. <clears throat> okay, so I have a couple of announcements tonight before roll call. Um, the first announcement is that the state of Colorado has announced that a mobile digital COVID exposure tracking application has been launched to help individuals be aware if they have been close to someone who has had a positive test for COVID. This application is available for cell phones running Google Android or Apple iOS and is secure and anonymous and will provide those signed up with a notification if someone they were near tests positive for COVID. Over 15% of Colorado cell phones have already loaded this application, which is expected to reduce COVID incidents by 8% please sign up to increase your own protection and that of fellow residents. More information and the application itself can be found at www.addyourphone.com. And the second announcement is that next Tuesday's study session on December 8th will begin at 5.30 p.m. to allow time for interviews for applicants for the Cannabis Licensing Advisory Board. And I will turn um, to Debbie and see if you could call roll, please. Absolutely. Council Member Brockett. Present. Friend. Here. Joseph. Present. Nagel. Fletlick. Present. Wallach. Present. Weaver. Here. Yates. Here. Young. Present. Mayor, we have a quorum. Very good. Thank you very much. And I will turn it over to Chris to introduce our next few speakers. Great. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, we're going to begin tonight with our COVID public health briefing um, that we do at the beginning of every month. So I'd like to welcome Jeff Zayak and Dr. Urbina uh, to give the briefing. Hi, thanks, Chris. Hi, council members. Thanks again for the invite. Always appreciate being invited back. So what I'm going to do today is walk us through the latest data update and tell you what we're seeing in the next few weeks ahead of us. Uh, and then some of the concerns that we have. And uh, we're going to finish with Chris is going to do an update on vaccine and where the vaccine is at this point, and what we can expect as we're moving forward. Uh, I want to thank the mayor for announcing the app, I have put that on my phone. Obviously, the more people that sign up for that, the better we can help control this disease, especially uh, with the type of situation that we're in now where we have lots of outbreaks. Um, can somebody share the slides for me or would you like me to share from here? Thank you. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And what I'll, what I'll be conscious of is just making sure that I am speaking slowly here. So thank you, Sarah, for that reminder. This, as you know, that we have three different measures from the state dial that we look at to determine where we uh, as a county are placed on the dial. This is the first one, and it's our current two week cumulative incidence rate. And in Boulder County, we're at 759.9 per 100,000 for two weeks. 
And that's a little bit better than it was last week. So our rates are starting to go down a little bit, but I'm going to talk about what we expect to see over the next week or so, um, because this is probably a short lived, um, a short lived win for us. And the, the challenge I want to illustrate here to everybody that's listening is this map is still largely red um, for incidence rate across the majority of the counties in the state, as you can see, which means that it's critically important that we work on strategies together um, to reduce this virus at this point with this wide of spread. And as you'll see, the spread is in multiple age groups. Next slide. This is our positivity, our two week positivity testing rate in Boulder County. We're at 6.7%. What you're gonna hear from me in the presentation is that we have a really adequate testing um, in Boulder County. We have four different testing sites as well as some pop-up testing sites that we are doing um, and we're testing well above uh, what's required of us uh, based on the national numbers, which is, you've heard me report before, 495 tests uh, per day. We are, we're well above that now. We're averaging 2,700. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our current hospitalization status, and there's three different levels. This dial just changed here, um, so you can see that it used to be just seven to ten, seven to fourteen days, or, or zero to seven days, and now they put a third level in here. We're currently in the middle level, um, and again, uh, I'll show you a slide specific to our current hospitalizations in Boulder County, so you get a better idea of what our actual trend looks like. Next slide, please. This is our metro area slide that I, I show you each time I come present. Um, and it is the, the, it's the seven metro counties. What you can see here is that if you look at the red, that's Boulder County, the spike that is around September to October, that was the spike that was so significantly bad at that time. Um, and it was the, uh, the outbreak that was associated with 18 to 22 year olds and our CU students coming back. And you can see how much more severe um, the, the number of seven day cases is across the Metro County. Um, this is a significant challenge for us. We did see that decrease, slight decrease. Um, and unfortunately what you're seeing in those little tails that are coming back up is what we expected, which is associated with travel that was happening in uh, around Thanksgiving, before Thanksgiving, as well as Thanksgiving, we do expect to see these cases increase again, unfortunately, as we move into the next two weeks. Next slide, please. This is the graph that shows um, in the dark blue, our number of cases that are non-CU affiliated, and then in the light blue, CU affiliated. Um, at what you'll see in the one of the graphs I'm gonna show you in a minute is we've had a little bit higher spike in the 18 to 22 year old population, um, which is also indicated from probably the early part of November here, we had done a really great job at knocking this population down in terms of the numbers of positives. And we've seen it climb up a little bit. Um, some of that was definitely associated with Halloween where we saw more enforcement actions that were necessary associated with parties. So we somewhat expected this, um, but students, as you all I think know now, are transitioning out. Most students have left campus at this point um, and we expect to see this number to decrease as we move forward. Next slide, please. This is um, our same graph, but it has long-term care facilities on it. Um, and you can see the challenge with long-term care facilities um, in this, this series of the outbreak, so in this last month and a half to two months, has not been inside the facility themselves, but it's been staff that are bringing the disease into the facility. Because we have so much uh, virus in the community, uh, we, we are seeing staff that are bringing that virus into the facilities themselves, uh, many of whom are asymptomatic. Um, the, the great news is, is that we, you'll hear in the, in the vaccine update that we've been able to link um, the vaccine distribution directly to these facilities, which are our high risk um, population. Um, and, and that is really good news as we move forward. Next slide, please. This is our, our five day average number of new cases. The main point I wanna make here is that 157 cases 
we're still well beyond our ability to effectively do case investigation and contact tracing. And uh, if you think back to that slide that showed the red counties all across the state, that's consistent with where we are at a state level. We still don't have the capacity to be able to effectively reach all the contacts that we need to. A lot of the outreach that we're doing at this point is either electronic or it is through a letter, um, but we, we are nowhere near the ability to be able to case, investigate and contact trace every single person who's positive or probable at this point. Next slide, please. This is the county residents who have tested positive or considered probable by municipality. Uh, what you can see here is this, and this is the cumulative rate per 100,000, uh, vast majority of the positives in the last week have been in Longmont. Um, so we continue to see the highest rates in Longmont. Next slide. Uh, this just demonstrates the relative contribution from each of our municipal areas. You can see that Longmont and Boulder um, are the largest contributors. Um, and then in the next slide, we're gonna see how that breaks out by, um, by our, our ethnic populations. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, it's one after that. Um, so this slide just demonstrates that middle peak that shows the 3,780 on it is the 18 to 22 year old population um, that we had the outbreak with CU in. And this shows all age groups uh, that are on, uh, that are currently um, in, in a, a total number of cases here for a two week incidence. What you can see here that I think is important to illustrate uh, is that we did and we have, and we still are seeing high level of case rates ac across most all of the age groups um, based on where our line has been um, if we look previously in this outbreak. Um, although we've seen the good news again that I, sh that I shared with you early on that we've seen some downward trend, you can see that that's flattening um, and it's likely to increase based on what we saw happening at Thanksgiving. Next slide. This is that um, the race ethnicity graph that I was sharing with you. Uh, and what we can see here in the orange is that that is our Hispanic Latinx population um, and the blue is our white non-Hispanic. And we continue to see a large proportion of our total cases um, in the Latinx population. And we know that this is an equity and it's a challenge for us. Um, we're working with our cultural brokers. Um, we're working with the city of Longmont specifically, the city of Longmont, 50% um, roughly of their, between 40 and 50% of their cases were in the Latinx um, population. So we know that this population specifically is one that we still need to continue to focus on in order to reduce this disparity. These are also the folks that are on our, uh, many of our essential critical businesses, frontline workers, um, and are exposed on a daily basis. Next slide, please. What this shows is the total testing capacity in Boulder County, or the total number of tests that we're running. I'm sorry, let me get rid of this. Um, the total tests that we're running in Boulder County, as I mentioned before, our average is around 2,700 per day. We have ample testing capacity in Boulder County with multiple sites now. Um, uh, several of the, two of those sites are dedicated to high priority populations, Lyons and Nederland. Um, and the other two drive up sites, Stasio Ballfield, thank you to the city of Boulder for continuing support of that. Um, and the one that we have in Longmont at the fairgrounds are drive up sites that are free uh, to the public. Next slide, please. This is our five day rolling average percentage positivity rate. Um, and because we have such a high amount of testing in Boulder County, uh, I don't know what ours is per capita to the rest of the sites across the state, but we certainly have a lot of testing um, comparative. Um, and it's why we have one of the lower rates across the state. If you look at some of the, the percentage positivity rates, you'll see that they're higher. Mo most of those are higher than Boulder County. Um, and it's because we do have a lot of testing, which means we're also identifying a lot of the folks who are potentially either asymptomatic or symptomatically positive in our county. Uh, but the number of tests is helping keep our percentage positivity rate 
uh, down further than some other areas. Next slide, please. This is our hospitalizations for Boulder County. This is not good news. Um, and as you can see, um, we've had a fairly steady climb in hospitalizations. Um, and we are, I, I'm not sure of the exact number today, um, but this trend is clearly headed in the wrong direction. Unfortunately, we expect to see this trend continue to climb um, as we move into the Thanksgiving and winter holiday period. Um, and that clearly depends, as you'll hear me talk about in just a few more slides at the end here, um, it clearly depends upon the actions that people take. This is preventable. I wanna keep illustrating that it is preventable um, and it depends on the behaviors that, that we each individually uh, take and the responsibility we take for those behaviors as to what these graphs look like moving forward. Next slide, please. This is the hospitalizations and death by age group. And what I wanted to point out here is that the, the, if you look at the age groups on the left-hand side, we see hospitalizations happening at the 18 to 22 year old age group even though we're not seeing many hospitalized ICU folks uh, at that age group, we are starting to see them at 25 to 34. Um, and you can see the numbers on the table there. Um, so this does impact more than just our oldest age groups. We are seeing hospitalizations starting in that 18 to 22 year old group. Um, our highest hospitalizations, unfortunately now are creeping up into the most sensitive and the most vulnerable age groups, which is 75 plus. And again, you can see a fairly high number in the 55 to 64 age group as well. So it is impacting people um, across that age range. Next slide, please. This is the state hospitalizations. Uh, I won't spend much time here, similar to the same trend that we're seeing in Boulder County. Next slide. This is our deaths, unfortunately. All these deaths represent somebody's loved ones, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles. Um, and unfortunately, when we see uh, increasing hospitalization rates and, in, and increasing incidence rates, this is what we know follows those things. Um, and you can see just from the end of October until where we are in November right now, we've had a significant number of deaths, um, high cluster, just like there was on the early portion of this outbreak. That is, again, preventable. It's what we want to avoid. Uh, and it really does come down to all of us taking responsibility to do the best we can to follow the precautions. Next slide, please. This is a projection from the Colorado School of Public Health. Uh, and this was modeled last week. But basically, this shows uh, the purple line there is based on a 60% transmission control. And when I say transmission control, they, the state just changed this language. This used to be what I was referring to as social distancing. Um, so just as a reminder, when we were in the early portions, March, April of stay at home, we were around 80% social distancing or transmission control. Um, and the numbers of infections in our community were lower than they currently are now. I'll talk about that more in a minute. The projection at 60% between when this model was run, um, which was uh, last week. So you can see if you look at where the 1123 number is and how that crosses that dotted line, the projections at 80% transmission control. So probably somewhere close to where we are right now. I don't know the exact numbers for this week. They're gonna run some more modeling um, at the Colorado School of Public Health after they get the updated numbers um, from what travel and cases look like from Thanksgiving. Um, we are, we're gonna see that many more excess deaths that occur between now and the end of the year. Um, so we know, again, the, the reason I put this graph up here is because we know that what we do can save lives and it can save businesses. Next, next slide, please. This is where I just wanted to focus a little more on that. We know um, that again, this is preventable. We literally can save lives and save our businesses. Um, many businesses, uh, as I've said to you before, uh, have been on the phone with me and pleading that they really can't make it through another series of restrictions like we're facing right now. We know that we are gonna lose businesses from this. We know that we are losing people's lives from this, and this is preventable. 
we can make a difference. Um, we have to work together. Uh, this takes coordinated effort across all those counties that you saw, and it takes individual responsibility, but we can make a difference. We are getting close. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and I'm going to have Chris, I'm going to shift it over here to Chris uh, real quickly, but just want to make sure that people are aware that with this many infections in our communities and the estimated number of people that are infectious in the state is around a one in, a, in 41 people. That's a lot of infection in our community. Um, and that's why we're seeing such steep uh, climbs in our incidence rates, such steep climbs in our hospitals and the number of deaths that we're seeing is because we have a lot of people infected in our community. And the only way we're gonna be able to control that is if we all act together. It can't just be 70% of us, it's gotta be all of us acting together and we can get a handle on this and we can again, prevent those deaths and we can prevent uh, businesses from, from losing their livelihoods. Um, we, we are gonna go into this holiday season and the best thing that we can do is stay, keep our gatherings to our family. Um, please uh, make sure you're wearing masks if you have to go out Wash your hands after you've been in, in public. Uh, make sure that you're social distancing to the maximum extent possible. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over here to, to talk about the hope message um, with vaccine that we know is coming to Colorado. So Chris, do you wanna take it from here? And you can go to the next slide. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Great, thank you, uh, Sam. Uh, Mayor and members of City Council, glad to be back uh, with you. I'm going to give you a very high level presentation of what's currently happening regarding vaccination planning, but stay around uh, because I know there are going to be lots of questions regarding this because it's a work in progress. Uh, I think that uh, it's a collaborative effort um, between the federal government, who's uh, working with our pharmaceutical industry to produce the vaccine, our state health department, as well as all the local health departments around, uh, around our state. So we're working closely with these three different partners, two, two different partners to kind of come up with a plan. And as we go about this work in progress, we're learning more and more and more. So I'm gonna just talk about two different uh, uh, components. One, how vaccines are developed and where we are in terms of that development, how it's approved and how do we assure that it's both safe and effective, and then talk about priority populations and finally leave it open for questions. So next slide, please. So this is a very busy slide, but I'm just gonna uh, talk a little bit about the vaccine life cycle and what that means. We've basically truncated this, this uh, life cycle very quickly in our federal government because of the intensity as well as the severity of this infection. So a lot of these pieces early on were, were truncated because we had several experiences with both SARS and, and MERS so that we had a couple vaccines in development and were able to use that technology to speed up the vaccine, that first part of it, the yellow orange part of this. But the development is still taking the same amount of time. The, the green part of this is really the safety phase one, uh, phase two is the effectiveness and phase three is safety and effectiveness to go combined. And over the last several months, you've heard about six different vaccines in the US that are being developed, as well as probably another couple hundred vaccines across the world that are being developed. Each has been going through this developmental phase where they take a population of people very diverse, different age groups, different sexes, different chronic medical conditions, um, and, and healthy people, healthy young people, to first test the vaccines on their safety. That's the first development. That usually takes a couple months. We're past that. Then they look at phase two. They give both a, a, um, a vaccine and a placebo to look at its effectiveness, at exposing people to their natural conditions out in the community to test of that population, how many people actually end up with the vaccine? And you've heard preliminary results from both Pfizer and Moderna, the mRNA virus, the vaccines, that 
that have been developed that they show that they're probably greater than 90% effective. That's good news. But they're still in phase three of that development where they're looking at both safety and effectiveness. Both of them have, 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 have tested uh, these vaccines against placebo in about 30 to 40,000 people. And they've shown promising results. Right now in that phase three, both Moderna and Pfizer have applied for uh, FDA approval for uh, emergency use uh, uh, utilization, so authorization, so that they are able to expedite the use once they prove they're both safe and effective to you approve their use among the general public. So we were at, right now at that blue, uh, light blue uh, uh, arrow there, looking at whether or not FDA is going to say the evidence is there for both safety and effectiveness. It's we can go ahead and authorize this emergency use authorization. And remember, this is what we did for many of the testing, many of the treat, uh, treatments that are currently being used in our hospitals. This is the standard process of how this gets approval. The next phase is this dark blue phase. So once the FDA approves this, the, and this is what the, uh, the, um, the um, uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, what, what usually, because nobody can remember that, they call it the ACIP, provides recommendations and that's actually occurring simultaneously with the FDA review so that we're doing these both two light blue and dark blue sections right now. So we're looking at kind of speeding this process up, not in the development of testing their sa safety and effectiveness, but in this process of the orange and yellow and the blue sections to get it approved. So all these vaccine companies, at least six of them, have already produced large numbers of these vaccines pending approval by both the FDA as well as recommendation review by the ACIP. So that's where we are right now. And ultimately the purple section, um, not related to the dial that Jeff has talked about before, is that next section where we, over a long period of time, look at the effectiveness and safety of this vaccine. So I'm gonna stop there and go to our next slide, but I know there are gonna be lots of questions about both. So we'll come back to this if you'd like. Next slide. So as we talked about, once the, it gets FDA approved and ACIP comes up with recommendations about how to distribute it, this is where the discussion is happening right now. Why? Because there's gonna be limited supply and we anticipate, and you've seen this on the national news and local news, where, what are the priorities for this phase distribution? Because the vaccine is not gonna to be totally available and it looks like the earliest dates will be the end of December where we'll start with the first phases. Now I'm, I'm gonna just cover these red sections as an overview because obviously they're making this decision right now as we speak. So the phase 1A, 1B and 1C are those populations that are critical workforce as well as highest risk individuals. And I think you can read this, but those are gonna be the healthcare workers, the long-term care assisted living facility workers, folks that are working with these high risk populations and we don't want them to be infected, as well as we want them to be protected uh, and so they can safely take care of patients that are currently positive. Our next critical workforce issue group is 1B, which is our EMS first responders, firefighters, police, public health workers, and correctional workers, people that are working on the front line who are serving all of us. We want them to be protected to continue to do their critical role uh, that they play in our communities so that we're all safe. And the final group of that first phase are the highest risk individuals. Those are people that are currently residing in long-term care facilities and, and, and nursing homes so that we can protect them. Because as Jeff pointed out in his slides, um, those are the folks that are most vulnerable who are likely to be hospitalized and ultimately die. So we're gonna want to prioritize those populations. So I'm gonna just stop and give you a comment about those critical workforce folks in, in phase one. We're gonna be working with our, and we've already contacted all our hospitals. They're contracting with local uh, large hospital, excuse me, large pharmaceutical chains that'll help us with the distribution of this vaccine, uh, both in hospitals and, 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 and healthcare facilities, as well as these long-term care uh, facilities. So we're gonna be hearing more about this, but we're, all of that process is beginning to evolve so that we'll, once these vaccines are approved and once we have access, not to all uh, uh, because it's being developed right now, but to a, a significant portion so we can cover this first phase. 
So that'll likely to occur in December and January. And then let's talk about phase two. These are the congregate house, uh, housing essential workers, people who are living in long, uh, people experiencing homelessness, incarcerated individuals, adults living in, in group homes, people living in congregate settings. Why are these people uh, uh, important? Well, those people that are, in those vulnerable populations that we're talking about, those workers that are working with those folks are, cl are clearly uh, could potentially exposed so that we want them to be uh, part of that next phase, phase two. And finally in phase two are the higher risk of in uh, individuals like myself over the age of 65, adults with chronic medical conditions and, 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 and those folks obviously who were volunteered to be a part of the clinical trials uh, who received the placebo and they'll know by then. And finally, is, and that's, those vaccines will probably be available probably early spring uh, or late spring. And finally, the, the general public will get the vaccine uh, in, in phase three, probably spring, summer, depending on the uptake uh, of the vaccine uh, in those populations. So we're working in a coordinated way with the federal government, the state government, our CDPHE, as well as all the local health department uh, folks. And our team has been working actively and working with those resources to prepare to receive these vaccines, uh, making sure that they we have coal storage, uh, we're making sure that we have all the supplies necessary, make sure we're informing. And this is probably the, the million dollar question is, can, can we be assured that people will take the vaccine once it's been available? And so I think we're gonna be spending a lot of time with the general public, working with our experts like our, 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 our respected leaders like all of you to get the message out that this vaccine will be safe and effective so that we can get people to, to actually get the vaccine. So ultimately, as Jeff talked about, as we transition from continuing to be safe with all our prevention strategies, we can start to increase our number of people that are being uh, immunized who can uh, pr be protected against the vaccine. So we can create a, a both natural immunity as well as herd immunity from the vaccine. So there will be, hopefully by next, uh, I'm, con uh, I'm uh, optimistic that by the next, uh, by next fall, we'll be having a quite different conversation than we are now in terms of the protection and opening our businesses and schools in a more effective way. So I'm gonna stop there and see if, if, if you have any questions for Jeff and I about the stuff that we've talked about so far. Mayor, does that sound reasonable? That's awesome. And I wanna say thank you to both you, Chris, and Jeff for being here and answering our community questions every month. It's super helpful. And I think there's gonna be a lot of excitement about the fact that we're moving into discussion of vaccines and delivery of them. So I don't see any hands up. Council members, if you have questions, please raise your hands. Um, I'll start with a question as I see hands coming up. Um, it, it looks like that we're gonna start seeing vaccines potentially here within a couple of weeks, both um, Jeff and the governor have said that within the last 24 hours. Jeff, you had referenced in the call yesterday that there might be 170,000 doses here um, in a couple of weeks. Is that still current? And, and what does that mean to us? How, how much of that phase 1A will be impacted if we get the 170,000 doses? I'm going to let Chris take that because he's going to have probably more accurate estimations. He's in these conversations and he can talk about what that looks like relative to that first population. Uh, great question, Mayor. Um, I think the uh, that number that Jeff gave you is probably based on a per capita estimate of how many vaccines we think we're going to get statewide and then how many Boulder County. We're right now working with our healthcare partners to estimate the number of healthcare workers, um, uh, healthcare providers, people working with those long-term care facilities. All We have all those numbers in place so that we'll have a fairly good uh, uh, uptake, hopefully, if people take that. So we'll have a fairly good cut into that, that 1A uh, 1B and 1C population. The, the challenge will be is how many people will find this uh, and, and take the vaccine. So if, if people say, no, we don't think this is safe and effective, then we'll have more vaccine. If people say, yes, we believe that it's safe and effective, and I believe it will be safe and effective once it's approved, approved by the FDA, we'll, we'll know better as we see, start to roll it out uh, if people will accept it. And then we'll know whether or not um, uh, we'll have enough vaccine to immunize all those 1A, 1B, and 1C. 
Very good. Well, thanks a bunch. And I will say that that slide that you had that broke down the different groups was very helpful. So if you can make sure that um, somebody at the city has this presentation, that would be great. And then I think what we'll, we'll be most interested in going forward is when you can put schedule to that, because it is great to know that we're getting started. Um, I think it's a clarion call for everyone to be on their best behavior as far as disease prevention goes, because we're getting close. And if we're getting close, we want to help everyone get to the point where they can get a vaccine. So I have four hands up now. I have Mark, Mary, Aaron, and Rachel. Mark? Uh, yeah, my first question is for Jeff. And of course, uh, as always, thank you for the presentation. Um, do we track data uh, in terms of case rates, hospitalizations, and deaths between uh, people who have underlying medical conditions uh, versus those who do not? Not, Chris, do you know the answer to that? I don't think we have that data broken out. I have not seen it relative to that. So I, am, I do not believe we do have that data. I'd have to go back and ask that question of Emily. Okay, and, and my other question is for so Mark. I can, I can answer that because we don't have access to, uh, and we take a lot of work to know. We can know we know on national studies uh, what percentages of folks who have uh, diabetes or chronic medical conditions can, are hospitalized, as well as who die from those potential complications. But we have that at, at a national level, not at a state and local level. Much 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 more difficult to track. Okay, thank you. And my, my next question, or my second question is for you. Um, there are at least two vaccines who are, that are becoming to market and possibly more. Um, how are they going to be um, distributed? Uh, are they simply going to be advertising, take mine, take mine? Or, or uh, <laughs> will, will there be any data that says this vaccine is more effective um, for people of color or for this particular age group? Um, but, but how will, you know, how will that happen? Uh, great question. So part of the process right now, and, and they have to present, both these two companies you're referring to, Moderna and Pfizer, they have to present their data. And they have to present that data of the effectiveness and safety among each of those populations, men, women, older age groups, younger age groups, people with chronic medical conditions, because they have that all in their clinical trials. They've compared that with a placebo group that's stratified in equal, equal uh, numbers uh, with each of those categories of things. So they have to present that data. And then once that vaccine is approved, then that information sheet that comes with each of those vaccines says that this is the effectiveness of the vaccine, this is the safety. These are the complications, what you, you, what you get after the vaccine, or sore shoulder, fever, aches and pains, those kinds of things all have to be revealed to the public. So then the public decides whether or not they wanna take the vaccine. Unfortunately, uh, I think that the vaccine, because, of it is, because it's being rolled out slowly as it's being developed, because obviously the vaccine producers don't wanna make a hundred million of the vaccine before they know it's approved, they started out with a smaller quantity. So this is gonna be rolled out. Probably they both be rolled out at about the same time. So the facilities will probably get a sampling of Pfizer's, they'll get a sampling of Moderna, and then the, the, probably if they're available, the, the consumer will decide, well, I, I've looked at the product information, I'm, I'll take the Pfizer. They may not have a choice, that healthcare facility or that pharmacy that's delivering the vaccine may have only that one vaccine. So, okay, thank you. Yeah, that's helpful, Chris, very much. Um, next, I have Mary. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and um, and thank you, Jeff, for your presentations. Um, I have kind of a follow-up question to Mark's question regarding cost of vaccines. Are they going to be available? Um, for free on a sliding scale with health insurance? How, how is that going to work? Uh, these are all good questions and thank you for asking them because I do think the public needs to know this. Because the federal government largely subsidized these vaccines in their development, the vaccine has to be provided free of charge. Now, there are going to be accommodations because the whoever is providing the vaccine will be allowed to provide a vaccine charge, but they cannot that can be waived easily if the person who's receiving the vaccine cannot pay that. So it's essentially free for everyone. 
And um, you, we've been getting um, a few emails about um, asking us to make sure that it is optional. And will there be a requirement to have get vaccinated or how will that work? Uh, at this point, we could not require anybody to take this vaccine. We will highly encourage it. Uh, there are no rules. In the past, we have made rules, and I was part of this, about vaccines like the flu vaccine for healthcare workers. But at this point, there are no requirements for the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. And um, so Jeff, in his presentation, mentioned that they are um, deploying certain strategies to address the disparities, racial and ethnic disparities that we're seeing. And I'm wondering um, to what extent both for testing and hospital, for all testing, hospitalizations and vaccination, um, to what extent is data being disaggregated in order to inform the strategies? So are you um, for example, looking at um, hospitalizations and breaking it down by age, um, type of occupation, um, race and ethnicity. How are you, yeah, what are the strategies behind, um, it, how are the strategies being informed by data disaggregation? Yeah, I'll start and I'll see if Chris has anything to add to this. So I'll give you an example without disclosing any personal information. What we do when we doing when we're doing the case investigations, and it's primarily associated with our case investigations. So it's the information we're learning about where the person lives, who they who they have potentially exposed, any associated follow up cases with them, um, and at that point is when we're collecting that demographic data. Um, and we find out who they've been exposed to, what their work scenario is, those kinds of things. And we could see patterns clearly um, in many of these cases where we know the person is getting exposed. It could be associated with a family gathering. It could be associated with where they work. We know what the probable cases are looking like. We can see where there's clusters occurring. Um, so when I talked about Longmont, um, we were very aware of an outbreak in Longmont that involved a host of people that lived in a, in, a, uh, in an area. And we were able to go out and do some pop-up testing specifically for that area. So that's the type of strategy we're using when we're looking at the data to try to make decisions about where do we go? How do we do it? And obviously, I know Mary, you're involved in some of this too, but we are very connected to our cultural brokers to help make sure that when we're approaching populations that we're doing it in the most culturally sensitive way that we can, because we want folks to feel comfortable and we want them to know what their status is and we wanna help support them if they have to be in quarantine or isolation. Um, Thank you, Mary, Jeff. Like, Council member, I'd like to also add to that. When, when Campbell and I both came up with st uh, testing strategies and priorities, we, thought we looked at that epidemiologic data and looked at those populations and said, we need to place those testing centers close to those populations. And we did a lot of media and information gathering out there to make sure that those populations had access. Now that's a challenge, as you know, people are, are cautious about, about testing, they're cautious, and they're actually frankly busy um, and working two or three jobs to kind of sustain their families. So we're very sensitive to that, so that we tried to make testing available in the evenings and on weekends, and so it's available to lots of populations. I'd like to add to the vaccine strategies. As I reviewed all the federal literature prior to this presentation, there was a big focus on equity in terms of prioritizing and making sure that the distribution hit populations um, that were racial or ethnically different uh, and uh, 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 to make sure that that lens was uh, looked at and to make sure that those populations were included in the vaccine trials. So that to make sure that those populations were tested and, and the vaccine, vaccine was safe and effective among those populations as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. <clears throat> Next, we've got Aaron and Rachel. Aaron. Yeah, Jeff and Chris, thanks so much for that information. It's extremely helpful. As Jeff, I had one question for you about hospitalization rates. So you uh, showed the graph with the, the total number of hospitalizations. 
Uh, how are we doing on capacity and what are the projections for capacity uh, in our hospitals over, over the next few weeks? So there is um, a new measure in a new slide and I'll make sure I include it next month that actually looks and tracks that more closely related to um, what the governor's purple level is, which um, is directly associated with uh, hospital capacity and surge capacity and where they're at. But what, in general, what we're hearing from our hospitals is that it's not that they can't, uh, they can't, they don't have enough medical beds or we haven't heard yet that we have ICU bed shortages. What we are hearing from our hospitals is that there's staffing shortages. So, uh, and a, a, a good example of that is you haven't probably seen or heard of many hospitals yet saying we're gonna stop scheduled surgeries. And I, I call it scheduled surgeries versus elective because obviously some of these are really important surgeries for people, right? You know, cancer treatments, those kinds of things that are really important for people to be able to have a safe and quality of life. Um, but those have not generally happened yet. Um, and that's because hospitals do have the capacity, but they don't have the staffing at this point. That is the limiting factor that we continue to hear with hospitals. And what I can say to folks on the phone that are tuning in or, or, or on the computer or on the television is we need to let our healthcare workers know how much we appreciate their heroic efforts right now. Because what we're finding is that and if you think back to April, people were doing the howl at eight o'clock at night. They were recognizing the efforts of our healthcare workers. And when you have healthcare workers who are exposed to people who can be positive or were exposed on a daily basis, and at the same time, they see people who are defiant of wanting to wear masks or do those kinds of things, they're putting themselves in harm's way every day to do the best they can to protect our community. So we need to make sure that people know how much we appreciate those healthcare workers, those frontline workers who are out there every single day, uh, continuing to serve our communities. Um, and we need to do it for them as well. So that's the message I would wanna to add to that for everybody to be aware of. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Jeff. It's, it's good to hear about the hospitals, but such an important message that uh, our healthcare workers are, are heroes day in, day out, keeping us all safe. So they need our support. Thanks, that's all I had. Thank you, Aaron. Rachel? Yep, I will um, plus one on that last sentiment as well on healthcare workers. I live with two and it's um, important that we do what we can to keep them safe as they are keeping us safe. Um, so I just had one question. It was, uh, Sam reads something at the beginning of meetings about um, installing the sort of um, tracking application for you know, exposure notifications. Um, and uh, I think Jeff mentioned that he has downloaded it. I have too, um, but I've gotten some feedback from community members that they're worried about that app, that they think it's going to um, reveal private data or allow the government to track them if they're not complying with like quarantining and things. So just wondered if anybody could speak to that, um, that it's my understanding it is um, a safe app to use and it's not transferring any data or anything dangerous, but is there anyone who could um, speak to that for the community? Chris, do you, do you have a sense of that? If not, I can, I do absolutely the same things that you've heard, I've heard when I read the site, it was really clearly talking about, this is not collecting private information. What I don't know is all the back end on that. So I can't tell you how it works or, or how the, the data is protected. But I have, but that's the same things I've heard is that it is protected data. They're not sharing personal information. Um, and I don't know if, if Chris, you have more information on that. If not, what we would do is, is certainly be willing to follow up with you all and get you that information because we do think it's really important. Yeah, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, uh, council member, a uh, friend. I, I, I'm not a techie, so I don't know, but I would encourage people to go to the website and look at their at, at look at the application because they put a lot of emphasis and information there, and then people have to make their own decision. So, yeah, okay, um, I appreciate uh, both of those responses. And if there is any extra information that we can put out for the community or um, have at the ready for our next council meetings, that might be helpful. Thanks. That's the only question I had. Great, and I'll follow up, <clears throat> Rachel, with that. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, it's www.addyourphone.com. And much of the information that Rachel asked about is also uh, to be found on that website. So 
And with that, uh, Chris Meschuk, I think that we are done here. Thank you again to Jeff and to Chris Urbina for being here and for um, keeping our community informed. Great. Thanks again, Jeff, Chris. Uh, we're going to switch now to uh, item 1B, which is uh, a COVID education enforcement and compliance update. Um, and so um, I did want real quick to address, Rachel, your question about um, the um, exposure notifications app there is. It is anonymous, what they call tokens. It's essentially a string of letters and numbers that phones exchange with each other via Bluetooth. So it doesn't track your location. It doesn't track any other information on your phone. And if you go to the website that Sam described, there's info uh, that describes how that process works and when, when those anonymous tokens are deleted from your phone and if there is an exposure that you're notified on, how that process works. So there's lots of great information on that website. Um, and with that uh, transitioning, and if we can get the presentation pulled up, um, at the request of council at the last meeting on November 17th, um, we'd like to share a little bit of an update on um, everything that we've been doing related to um, really trying to, to turn, especially this, this current curve of the pandemic. So um, we're going to present the current activities and outcomes, as well as some planned additional activities um, and actions that the city can take. If we can go to the next slide. What we've really learned through the pandemic as we've been going is that it takes a systems approach to um, uh, approach changing community behavior to stop the spread of COVID. Um, and so to that end, um, we're going we're gonna to include more than just enforcement information, which is what we talked about um, on the 17th, um, and really talk about everything we've taken related to education, prevention, support, as well as enforcement. Um, and as you're going to hear, we, we can't simply enforce our way through the pandemic, but we have to take several simultaneous actions. Um, so we have several presenters that are lined up for this, um, including communications, community vitality, the city attorney's office, as well as um, members from multiple departments, as well as partners from the county that are here um, to be able to answer questions. So first, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Huntley, our communications and engagement director, um, to to cover the, the current efforts related to communications and engagement. Then I'll turn it over, we'll turn it over to Yvette Bowden, uh, Assistant City Manager and Director of Community Vitality for business and community support. And then finally, Sandra Giannis from Deputy City Attorney and the City Attorney's Office that'll cover compliance and enforcement. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Can I get the next slide, please, Emily? Okay, so I'd like to kick off my portion of this presentation just reminding everybody what I think we all already know, which is that communications engagement and outreach does not equal enforcement. However, it is really foundational to people understanding what's expected of them. And so it, we consider it sort of a building block to any other enforcement actions that we may decide to take as a city organization. I'm going to go first into some detail on some ongoing efforts. So things that we've been doing for a number of months now that have proven to be successful um, from an analytics perspective in terms of people actually clicking and using the resources as well as qualitative feedback we've received from the community. So I think you're all aware that when the pandemic started back in March, we created a comprehensive coronavirus website and it's broken into different sections depending on the kind of person you are because the information might be specific to who you are. So for example, there's a tab for residents, there's a tab for businesses, and there's also a tab for city employees where we have um, internal messaging for city employees. We also have created a Spanish language hub that has much of the same coronavirus information on it. We prioritize pandemic and economic fallout type information when we decided which things we were going to translate first in the city. We also are responding as quickly as we can to community member questions. As council members, I know you've received quite a few of those through the council email, and I hope you've seen staff trying to jump in and respond when appropriate and refer folks to other partners who might have more current information when we can. We also created a separate email address for the public to use. 
We have been having daily meetings. We've now gone to two or three times a week, but we can still ramp up to daily if we need to with our communication partners in the county. When the CU issue was um, a top issue of concern, we were also meeting with CU. We also meet with state communications professionals. And the idea there is to make sure that we are providing consistent and accurate information. We also recognize that we all have additional audiences and networks, so we often try to amplify each other's messages. The other program we stood up quite early on, and we intend to continue at least through the first half of 2021, is our Emergency Response Connectors program. This has been phenomenal in terms of reaching people who we might not otherwise reach. We have roughly 25 emergency response connectors who are community members who already are trusted in their neighborhoods or in their communities of choice. Um, and they are helping us convey information out to the community about COVID and resources we have available. But perhaps more importantly, they're bringing information back to us about what the community needs are. And 10 of these connectors are bilingual bicultural and they are um, on a stipend to help us also strategize outreach to the communities that we know are more vulnerable um, as, the, as the presenters before me were talking about. Next slide, please. Um, that shouldn't be the next slide. Can you go? Okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to um, jump ahead then. This slide shows you some of the new things that we are trying. There should be a couple of slides before this, but apparently we're having difficulty with the presentation deck. Some of the new things to add to those programs that we were already starting and have been running for the last several months is we have worked with our partners in HHS to create some magnets that have information on COVID recovery, food stability, and housing resources. We are also stepping up our use of our video production team. We have some very talented videographers on our Channel 8 crew, and they are going to help us do more short length, informative, and inspiring storytelling. We also have the Youth Opportunities Advisory Board working on a video of their own speaking to their peers, which we're super excited to roll out. We also have um, just launched the city's first ever podcast. I'm very excited about this. This is the brainchild of Manuela Cifuentes, our language access program manager, and Jocelyn Avendano, who is our news producer and anchor. They have um, a conversation in Spanish about the disproportionate impacts of COVID on communities of color and discuss the data as well as resources that are available. And we are promulgating that on all the places people would ordinarily go to find cool podcasts. And we're getting some very good reaction from our community on that. We also started the community briefings that um, I think many of you have participated in. We were having those weekly in a virtual space as we move forward, we're actually gonna coordinate with the county. We are going to do a better job of publicizing the very briefing you received tonight. So the first Tuesday of the month briefing for community members to watch because we think it's very robust and informative. The county starting next week is going to begin countywide briefings in the very similar fashion to how we piloted our briefings. Um, it was very popular and they heard from people in other county communities that they would like this opportunity. So we're going to encourage Boulder residents to join the county briefings. And then we're currently talking to the county about whether one of those briefings a month, perhaps the third week of the month, to go nicely with the first week of the month, um, you all receiving an update, if we could have a city focused briefing or Q&A session as part of the session that they are hosting. Um, we're still working out the details on that, but that way people would have five different po touch points during the month. They would be able to watch this meeting and then there would be one weekly briefing a month to tell them what's happening in Boulder County. And at least one of those would include city officials. So individuals in the city could ask us questions. Next slide, if the slide deck's gonna cooperate, please, Emily. Okay, it is not cooperating. So I would like to just quickly um, 
highlight a couple of other things that were on some slides that I added that I'm afraid are not showing up in this deck this evening. Um, if you bear with me, I'm just going to pull up my version of the presentation so that I can do that. So some of the other things that we've been doing um, have had to do with our social media presence, and that's an ongoing uh, work that we've been doing. We're leveraging all of our social media channels to do what we hope are fun and relevant posts. You may have seen the Thanksgiving posts. Um, Shelby Condit, one of our very talented specialists, came up with some graphics that I actually were multicultural graphics um, to show different ways people can celebrate Thanksgiving safely. And again, I'm afraid that I can't show that at the moment because the slide deck isn't cooperating, but they um, were things about how to drop off food to family members' homes. There were also some um, examples of what a Zoom meeting might look like. I know our family had a Zoom Thanksgiving. Oh, excellent. Somebody has saved the day here. Thank you, Emily. Um, so we're really trying to create visuals that are easy for everybody to understand um, that we can put out as our own social media channels. And also, again, if public health partners have graphics or information, we are posting those as well. We are doing a weekly bilingual newscast with COVID updates as the top priority. And then we also um, are really pushing out COVID information in our e-newsletter each week, which we get more and more subscribers signing on to each week. So that's been a really helpful communication channel. Can we try for the next slide? Okay, so this is going to load, I hope, as we speak, but this is an animated GIF that, um, again, Shelby Condit created, and it just shows the um, impact that um, everybody having small gatherings and small bubbles might have. So, Emily, can you click on the slide and see if it will advance automatically? No. Okay. Well, Essentially, the bubble slide, as we call it previously, shows you how when you have your bubble, the people who you think are safe for you to gather with, each one of those folks have another bubble, and then those folks have another bubble. And so what it shows you is that it's really not safe to be gathering at all right now, and that's the takeaway message. Um, this does work on social media, I swear. It's a really cool graphic that goes by pretty quickly. And frankly, not to brag on my team, but I think this is one of the most compelling graphics that I have seen. And I've been looking at a lot of social media graphics about personal gatherings. Um, so I'm super proud that we've been able to push this out as unique content for the city of Boulder. Next slide. Okay, and then a couple of other newer efforts to go with the magnets and the other things I talked about. We have three radio ads in English and Spanish that are currently playing that we created in-house. The English ads are playing on Spotify, which is really interesting because Spotify can geocode. So as long as you're not a premium user who has paid to get no ads or public service announcements, if you're in the Boulder area and listening to Spotify, you have a very good chance of hearing one of our English ads. We also have Spanish ads playing on local Spanish radio stations. We are increasing our budget for paid advertising to amplify some of this great digital content that we're creating. So there are ways that you can boost your posts on our social media channels. And we're also going to be having conversations with the Daily Camera about whether we can use their digital ad space to do some COVID messaging. And then pending permission related to our sign code, we are also um, exploring the possibility of putting up some printed banners in public spaces, just reminding people on what the regulations are in the city of Boulder. Next slide. Okay, and then this is that other information that I presented. The graphic on the right just shows you what the magnets will look like, both in English and in Spanish. And I think that's the last of my slides. I'm sorry for some of the confusion with the version control. I'm going to pass over to Yvette. And then I think the idea is after we get through this whole presentation, if council members have questions about any part of the presentation, we will stay on the line as presenters to answer those. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. That was great. Um, I've visited, uh, had the opportunity to visit with council many times before. So I have just a couple of slides to remind you of the awesome work that's going on 
um, with our Boulder Business Response and Recovery Alliance partner organizations, which of course includes the state and county and many of our economic vitality partners. Uh, primarily, we have been involved on the compliance side in reminding people what it is to have safe operations, um, in providing them information that help them spread the word about required face coverings and social distancing signage, and resources and support as it might become available, federal, state, or local. On the right there is a sample of the banner signage, and you can see one of our local businesses with that in their windows. Many of these things were produced by our partners, and we've been uh, able to provide those to businesses free of charge, so I thank our partners. In addition, downtown Boulder has played a pivotal role in helping us demonstrate at one of our biggest tourist draws um, how to open safely. Uh, and with the Convention and Visitors Bureau and the Chamber and the Latino Chamber, really helping people spread the word about what's expected so that businesses feel supported that we're helping them spread the message of compliance, not only to the customers, but to their own workforce. So while you're seeing things here in the window, know that there's also signage that's been created for their back of house. Downtown Boulder also has ambassadors, as has the Hill Boulder, providing awareness and safety information and free masks in the community. And CBB has done an outstanding job of helping people navigate how to visit. So I've just given you one sample of probably more than a dozen um, portals that have been created about things to do in Boulder and how to do so safely. This one tells you about what to expect and uh, is regularly updated by the Convention and Visitors Bureau. They've even created what we're calling safe school trip or educational activities. We recognize that there are a ton of children being uh, educated in their home and they might get a little squirrely. And so CBB has done an awesome job of creating content that people can download at their home to help um, educate their children in the open space safely wearing a mask. We're always uh, welcoming an opportunity to work with CU. Um, and so there's a big banner uh, right now across Broadway and there are downtown banners on and off campus to help with outreach. Uh, we've been doing primarily through the chamber and the Latino chamber, industry safe operations, virtual web, uh, workshops, largely attended by um, businesses in Boulder but are also available to businesses across the county in coordination with the county. Um, through a grant that uh, Community Vitality worked on with Transportation and Mobility Department, we've installed hand sanitizing stations. Thank you, the Hill Boulder and Downtown Boulder Partnership and safety related murals, some of which you'll see in the remainder of this presentation. And finally, with council support, I can tell you that the restaurant SOS program and retail SOS programs have people ordering uh, food more safely from their home through NOSH and retailers benefiting um, from what we hope will sell out soon in a gift card uh, that's available to be redeemed at local businesses. Next slide. Very quickly, we also wanted to touch on something that I know many of you have had concerns about. Um, the testing site at Stasio is open. The site is open seven days a week for symptomatic and asymptomatic registrants through the uh, December 30th. That date is pivotal for all CARES Act work, so we wanted to always remind people of that. Swab tests are free. And I know council member friend, you've asked several times about turnaround time. Right now it's about four days. Um, and I recognize that we'd like to be faster, but I think it's a pretty good performance comparatively to other communities. There have been over 38, almost 39,000 registrants that have been tested at Stasio in just since September 25th. And the current capacity to test over 1400 registrants per day. The city's costs for the site are paid in collaboration with the state, but the city has set aside about 238,000 of CARES Act funding for the costs associated with site logistics at Stasio through December 30th. And we've provided information at the bottom for testing locations. Next slide, I'm turning it over to my good friend, Sandra Giannis from the city attorney's office. Thank you, Yvette, appreciate that. Hopefully everyone can hear me. 
Um, my name is Sandra. I'm the deputy city attorney and I supervise the prosecutors in municipal court. And I'm also part of the public health order enforcement team. During the past several months, the city has been providing public health order enforcement through a variety of means. This slide outlines the main enforcement tools that have been used in connection with public health order violations. I will go into more detail on each of these tools as we move through the presentation. Criminal citations have been issued by Boulder Police Department, the University of Colorado Police Department, and Open Space Rangers. Since the beginning, the enforcement strategy has been to increase compliance by focusing on egregious cases of large gatherings and repeat offenders. As you know, the city experienced a surge in virus counts in early September, mainly within the 18 to 22 year old age group. It is well documented that the virus can easily spread in large gatherings, particularly if people are without face coverings and not social distancing. As a result, the majority of enforcement action and data reflects a focus on this age group and social gatherings. City emergency stay at home orders are an effective targeted approach to problem properties. Civil nuisance abatement actions seek to obtain accountability for rental property owners and landlords. Great collaboration and teamwork between the city, Boulder County Public Health and CU began during the summer and continues to this day. IFC or the Interfraternity Council is the governing body of fraternities. They provide leadership to fraternities and the entire community and have been helpful in addressing issues related to group collegiate homes. Next slide. Under the authority of the Boulder Revised Code, Civil Emergencies and Disaster Section, the city issued Emergency Order 2020-4 on March 17, 2020, which prohibited violations of state, county, and local public health orders, thereby allowing criminal cases to be filed into municipal court and prosecuted by city attorneys. There has been a lot of great teamwork between the Boulder Police Department and CUPD on, on public health order enforcement matters. The majority of ticketing has been done by Boulder PD and focused on off-campus activities. CUPD has also contributed greatly to on-campus cases that have been forwarded to CU's Judicial Affairs Office of Student Conduct for Academic Consequences. Open Space Mountain Parks has also issued tickets and was responsible for the successful enforcement of a very large athletic team hiking together without face coverings or social distancing. We had a great outcome on that case. As part of the court sentence, the team was required to make public service announcement videos on the importance of following public health orders. The videos came out really great. Next slide. Thank you. A very effective and creative tool that we've used on two occasions is the use of city emergency orders to target flagrant, excuse me, flagrant repeat offenders by property address. The order requires that tenants of the property stay at home with very limited exceptions and requires tenants to report the names of who is living at the property because they're also prohibited from having guests. The first order was issued on September September 16th for one property, and the second order was issued on October 22nd for nine properties. All properties were personally served by officers. Any violation of these emergency orders would have resulted in a criminal citation. Fortunately, the orders were effective. We were able to achieve compliance as none of the subject properties had another violation. Next slide, please. This slide provides data from the Boulder Police Department regarding calls for service received. The left side of the chart reflects the number of calls received by dispatch. 
This chart shows the calls for service to either Boulder Police Department 911 Center or the CU Police Department 911 Center. These calls can be 911 or non-emergency calls for service. The bottom of the chart breaks out the number of calls by month. The dark blue are complaints for noise or parties, and the yellow numbers at the top of the columns are public health order complaint calls. On March 13th, the city began to enact emergency orders related to COVID. And on March 23rd, as indicated on the chart, the city issued a stay-at-home order for the city of Boulder. As you can see, there was a significant uptick of calls during May, in part due to the end of the school year and graduation, and in August when students returned for classes. September also had significant numbers, likely due to the Labor Day weekend, and as well as October due to Halloween falling, falling on a weekend. However, as you can see, we have seen a decrease um, month over month in calls related to noise party or public health order violations, particularly starting in um, October and then in November as well. Next slide, please. This data chart shows uh, Boulder Police Department citations issued month by month in 2020. In the early stages of the pandemic, um, CUPD and BT BPD focused on education with students by issuing warnings instead of citations. However, once students returned in August, officers began to enforce and write tickets when violations were observed. Consistent with the spike in number of calls in the previous chart, citations spiked at various times due to events, as previously mentioned, such as students returning, um, to college, Halloween, et cetera. It's important to note that the number of complaints can be high in comparison to the number of citations issued. There are several reasons for this. Number one, often there are multiple calls for the same property. Secondly, sometimes officers get on scene and complaints are unfounded or it may be a minor technical violation and they may issue a warning. If there are, if, excuse me, if there is no identifiable complainant and the offer, officer does not personally observe a violation, he's unable to write a ticket. And then lastly, violating parties sometimes do not answer the door when officers arrive on the scene. And in those circumstances, officers may come back and issue tickets on another day. It's key to remember that we cannot enforce our way to compliance. While many of the enforcement tools we've used have been effective, providing educational outreach and seeking voluntary compliance is still the most effective tool. Strict enforcement adds significant costs. Next slide. This data chart is from the municipal court and it shows a comparison of the total number of citations issued in 2019 versus 2020. The left column shows that there was a total of 35 nuisance party tickets issued last year. And the column on the right represents tickets issued for nuisance party as well as public health order violations, which resulted in 240 citations. We've been treating nuisance party charges and adherence to emergency order charges, both as public health order violations and that is why we have included it in the chart for 2020. So 2020 reflects the significant increase in citations, as you can see, um, a 585% increase, in fact, from one year to the other. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, the majority of cases involve college students and therefore the typical court sentences and outcomes are crafted with that in mind. The city attorneys prosecuting these cases take them very seriously. They review each and every case and recommend outcomes based on the severity of the case and whether the person is a repeat offender. 
Students with public health order violations have extensive educational and financial requirements. Typical court sentences for first time offenses require completion of all of the following. So the first being CU's restorative justice program, students Student cases benefit from the city's collaboration with CU and their restorative justice program geared specifically to public health order violations. CU restorative justice addresses the relationship between the defendant and the community. A defendant is required to meet with a CU facilitator and members of the community to talk about the harms inflicted on the community holding the offender accountable for their actions and creating a plan for the offender to give back to the community. The Community Living Class is a 90 minute online class offered by CU. This class educates students, students on quality of life crimes most often committed by college students in Boulder. They learn about the law in Boulder concerning among other things gatherings, parties, noise, alcohol, marijuana. Community service. So typically 40 hours of community service are imposed to serve our local community, but that of course varies depending on the case. Costs uh, are typically around $400. The court fees are 195. The um, CURJ, excuse me, CU restorative justice fee is around 100, and the remaining amount is for the community living class and community service fees. There's a 500 word essay that they have to complete reflecting on the person's actions and the harm caused. And then the case also gets reported to CU's Judicial Affairs Office of Student Conduct for potential academic penalties. As of November 25th, CU's Judicial Affairs has received 1,319 on-campus referrals for violations of campus uh, COVID-19 policy. The, excuse me, the vast majority of these are students not wearing a mask or students violating the guest policy in the residence halls, which is more strict than public health orders. Students can have one guest per resident housed in each room, and they must be from the same residence hall. Most rooms have a maximum capacity of four. If a public health order is more strict than the policy, then they must follow the uh, public health order. A majority of referrals come from CUPD and resident advisors in dorms. 220 off-campus referrals for violations of public uh, health orders were received and the majority of those were from Boulder Police Department. 659 students have received educational interventions. There's a range of educational interventions. They're based on existing classes that are often used for alcohol and marijuana related incidents or other types of intervention, including the restorative justice process. 152 students were placed on probation, typically six to nine months based on the severity of the violation. 41 students were suspended. Most students were suspended through the end of the fall 2020 semester and they will be able to return in the spring. They receive a W on their transcript and they have to reapply through a specific returning student process. Since the pandemic, there have been very few uh, repeat offenders in terms of individuals. Um, our current policy for repeat offenders is we don't offer a plea offer. We take these cases very seriously. Um, they either have to plead guilty to the charge or set their case for trial. And there's a criminal conviction that's put on their record. Um, and then additionally, the judge may impose a $1,000 fine the maximum allowed under the law with 600 suspended on the condition of no new violations for a year. Repeat offenders also have to pay a $100 failure to comply fee, complete additional community service in addition to the original hours uh, of sentence and they're required to write additional COVID reflection essays. 
Um, in comparison, a first time offender would typically receive um, what's called a deferred prosecution in which they enter a guilty plea. And as long as they uh, satisfy all the probation conditions and don't receive another violation for nine months, that case gets dismissed. And so they have that opportunity to keep their criminal record clean. Um, again, there's a lot of discretion in terms of the offers that we provide. We review each case on a case-by-case -case basis and certainly um, assess the seriousness of each case. Next slide, please. The city has and continues to pursue new civil nuisance abatement cases against landlords and property owners for properties that have become a nuisance to the surrounding community through multiple violations or egregious conduct. The city's public nuisance code provides a means uh, by which the city can abate public nuisances. The city can seek abatement of a nuisance if users of a property commit two offenses within 12 months or three violations within 24 months that serve to annoy adjacent residents. In an effort to control and spread the code the spread of COVID-19 and to mitigate the effects of the disease, the city issued emergency order 2020-19 to expand the definition of public nuisance found in the code to include underlying facts related to a violation of any public health order. Other notice provisions were also amended to allow for service of notice by electronic mail and extending timeframes of potential violations. In an effort to gain voluntary compliance, a nuisance abatement case starts by providing the property owner with written notice that they have been identified for potential civil action. An overwhelming majority of properties were compliant after their first notice was received. In the circumstance where non-compliance continues, the case proceeds to stage two, a required meeting in which the property owner, landlord, or rental property management, tenants, and potentially neighbors seek a resolution through agreement by the parties to take state steps to abate the nuisance. If compliance is not reached at this stage, a civil action is filed with the municipal court where the court may impose injunctive relief. In those circumstances, the city may seek rental license revocation as well as other injunctive relief. Currently, there are 22 active cases in stage one. There are two cases that are moving into stage two, and there are over 100 cases under review. Next slide, please. Even before the outbreak at CU in the fall, the enforcement team has been meeting regularly during the summer to plan for the challenges that we thought might be coming. Those meetings continue to take place twice a week with daily more, excuse me, daily morning reports seven days a week from Boulder Police Department on activity and tickets issued the night before. The daily reports are really helpful in identifying problem areas, targeting resources, and getting a big picture view of public health violations within the city. During the meetings, we share enforcement information, discuss strategies, planning for upcoming challenges, such as Halloween, holidays, where there's an uptick in social gatherings, and football games. This kind of boots on the ground reporting has been instrumental in the success of enforcement because it, it allows us to pivot and use different tactics when necessary. As an example, we'd heard from other university towns that despite public health orders, people were still tailgating and having home parties during college football games. As a result of our meetings, we were able to strategize and plan ahead to implement actions to mitigate that outcome. We worked with communication reps from the city, Boulder County Public Health and CU to push out educational information, encouraging responsible game watching activities. We also had extra patrols in place to curtail that activity before it even started. Another proactive example of enforcement involves at least two, two circumstances in which Boulder Police Department was able to prevent parties from even happening in the first place 
by receiving and responding to anonymous tips. And next slide, please. Collaboration has been a key component to successful enforcement actions and the current trend towards more compliance. Boulder County Public Health Order 2020-9-1 um, was uh, created in an effort to reduce the possibility of outbreaks by requiring collegiate group homes, meaning any off-campus property in the city of Boulder where more than four students of higher education live in a group living in arrangement to submit and receive public health approval for a collegiate group home assessment. The assessment must describe COVID-19 prevention and mitigation measures implemented at the facility, provide for weekly check-ins and include isolation protocols among other requirements. Public Health has reviewed and approved approximately 30 assessments representing nearly all collegiate group homes in the city. Weekly check-ins with these groups facilitated by city staff, CU and Public Health are ongoing. ISC meetings, several meetings have taken place with fraternities, sororities, and um, the IFC council to address collegiate home problem properties. These meetings have been successful in curtailing illegal activities of problem properties and resulted in significant consequences from the IFC and at least, in at least one circumstance, the decision by a fraternity to vacate the tenants starting at the Thanksgiving holiday and keeping it vacant through, through the spring semester. Boulder County Public Health nuisance cases for re repeated or egregious violations, public health has a heavy hammer and may designate a property as a public nuisance and source of communicable disease, specifically COVID-19. Public health has a statutory duty to investigate and abate nuisances when necessary in order to eliminate sources of epidemic or communicable diseases and conditions affecting public health. If other efforts to stop violations fail, public health will seek a court order for the property to be vacated until all applicable COVID-19 disaster declarations are no longer in effect. To this point, public health has achieved voluntary compliance and has not had to seek a closure order in court. As a result of the city's collaboration regarding enforcement information, public health has designated four properties within the city as a public nuisance and sources of communicable disease based on repeated and egregious public health order violations, specifically gatherings that violate those orders. Public Health issued notice of these nuisance designations to property owners, tenants, and property managers. Public Health has also sent warning notices um, and messages to property owners for 26 additional properties that are at risk of nuisance designation based on recent gatherings. Public Health is currently preparing to send warning notices and messages to four additional properties based on recent violations. And lastly, business violations. The city attorney, Tom Carr, has been receiving and responding to complaints regarding businesses. He has personally reached out to each business who has received a complaint and attained voluntary compliance. In addition, the Public Health COVID-19 call center has received over 1,300 complaints. In response to an observed or reported public health order violation, Public Health's business liaison team is committed to first contacting businesses in order to educate and encourage compliance, in large part because Public Health has been holding weekly webinars with businesses in partnership with the Chamber of Commerce. The business team has been able to attain voluntary compliance in the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of cases. These webinars help businesses push out updated public health order information and they're always available to answer questions by email or through the call center. Since March 2020, public health has only pursued legal action against one business for failure to comply with public health orders, and that stopped the violations. 
During Safer at Home, Public Health has issued eight notices of violation to businesses for public health order violations. Next slide, please. We reached the end of the presentation. Most, most importantly, I want you to know that there are many dedicated staff that are committed to doing all they can to change people's behaviors and achieve health order compliance. The importance of this work cannot be overstated. Our lives may indeed depend on it. Thank you for your attention and the opportunity to share this important information. We have representatives from several areas that are ready to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Sandra. And thank you to Yvette and to Sarah for that really comprehensive, very helpful overview of enforcement. Um, Council, I will turn to you to see if there are any questions. Mark? Just two short ones. Um, has there been, uh, I guess this would be uh, addressed to uh, Sarah, I think. Um, has there been any thought given to extending uh, Stasio beyond 1230? That's actually a financial question related to when we have CARES Act funding through. Um, Chris, do you want to answer that? Sure, I can answer that. Um, we have have been helping fund the logistics of keeping the Stasio drive through testing site open. Um, so the state itself pays for um, the test itself. Each of those tests costs about $100 total. Um, and so um, uh, we're just supporting the logistics of that site. So if you've been through that testing site, those big storage boxes, um, cones, traffic control on really busy days, that sort of thing. Um, it, depending on the status of COVID, um, uh, that's something that we're going to continue to assess um, in partnership with the state, uh, as well as um, I think it'll be, and it's on, on our radar as a, really a financial conversation, and it's something that, that we're wrestling with with the drive through sites across the county that are supported through the, the CARES Act funding, um, but it's something we're still closely watching. Thank you, Chris. My, my other quick question is for Sandra. Uh, um, when we issue an emergency stay at home order for uh, a property and uh, the, the people residing there, um, can I assume that enforcement is based on an honor system or we don't have anybody watching, do we? Well, um, partly it's the honor system, but also um, I think that there is additional enforcement. We do check on those properties, but there's also a level of um, personal responsibility. And I think having that information out in the public, um, we have heard from people that have been under stay at home that they know people are watching. And so there's um, more attention placed on their um, property because of that. So I think that they're less likely to, to violate. Okay, thank you. you Great, Rachel. Sorry, I have this new headphone too today. Um, thank you for the presentations. Um, I'll try and be really quick because I know we're behind. Um, number one for Sarah on um, Zoom, it looked like you guys were going to blast out like, look, there's these great ways to communicate indoors with your family. Try Zoom. And, you know, Zoom is limited to 40 minutes and then I think you get charged. So I just wonder, is there any, you know, the same way that we provide like broadband or computers and things for um, people who may need it? Is there any effort to try and help uh, provide the community with a platform like Zoom. You probably don't have the answer today, so just putting that out there. Um, and then number two, um, on the, re I guess this one's for Yvette, on the retailer SOS program, can that be used online for online purchases? Yes, it can. Um, thank you for your question, council member. Um, okay. Yes, it can. Um, the challenge has been that we have to get the businesses signed up and then they have to get some experience in processing the transactions. Um, so we will improve over the days to come some information for them, but I'm pleased to say that uh, we've, we've already spent about a third um, of our match um, that's already out there. So people should keep shopping local. Um, mm -hmm. About 18,000 of that has already been redeemed over the past weekend. And I know that there was an earlier question through uh, hotline about 
um, the number of restaurants that are signed up through NOSH. We started with about 10 and as of today, we're at 39. We continue to take restaurants that will be available for this program and um, would like to make sure that we expend those dollars before the end of December. Awesome, thanks. Um, and then another thought for Sarah was, um, you know, to the extent that you're pushing out these new um, ideas on, on social media platform, I haven't noticed any um, particular emails to council members saying, here's a new um, podcast or, or the other new things. Like, can you all push those out? I know that um, some council members have, um, I guess, newsletters that have big subscriber lists and other people have a lot of Facebook or Twitter followers. So maybe just to, you know, a lot of times, like if I endorse something, I'll be asked to push it out on social media. So maybe sure. we could do that as council members. Yes, we can do that. We did summarize them in a heads up, but we can send them out as individual items that you can include. Yeah, and just an easy link might be helpful to get them out to the sure. community. <laughs> Sorry, Manuela. Um, okay, so let's see. How, um, this is for Sandra. How many tickets have been issued not to CU or not around CU students or properties? I don't have that breakdown, um, but I would say very few. We have only focused on the egregious cases and those um, have been, major majority have been college, you know, 18 to 22 year olds. That's definitely been where we spent a lot of time because that's where um, the activity was happening. Okay. Um, let's see. I, I think that those are my only quite, oh, one more. I had asked, um, to, to learn what other cities are doing in terms of enforcement. Did we get that information? You know, I didn't Maybe. make that part of my presentation. Um, and specifically, um, I can certainly follow up and provide that for you. Um, we have been having um, some connection with, uh, you know, university towns and that sort of thing in terms of what they've been doing. And it's pretty consistent with what we're doing. I think we're a little bit more innovative in the sense that we have been using uh, our city's emergency powers in a more creative way. Um, so, we've actually been asked to provide information about that, but I can certainly dig deeper if that's something that you're interested in. Sure, I don't know that it, it needs to be you, but certainly that would, um, from somebody would be helpful. So thank you. Those are all my questions. Great, thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> so I believe that's everything. Um, Chris, I'm ready to move on unless there's something else. No, that was it. Great. Well, thank you all. Um, very, very helpful presentation. And uh, hopefully the enforcement will have sent the message that this is a very serious issue that the city is taking quite seriously. So um, I will pull up briefly. One, one thing I will ask council for is um, as we move forward with the rest of the agenda, um, I would ask for a motion to amend the agenda to add item 8B. It is a reminder about bias and microaggression training. So moved. Second. second. Great, so Mark got that second. Does anyone object to amending the agenda? Great, seeing no um, objection, that will pass unanimously. And I believe we're ready for open comment, right, Debbie? Sorry, yes, we are. Okay, very good. So for open comment, I would remind us, um, everybody uh, is um, trying to do their best here. And so as you make comments about people in the community or members of staff, um, it would be great if you could keep in mind that everyone is trying to do their best um, as they know how to do it. So gentleness would be great. So to begin with, we have Luis Chaula, Chelsea Castellano, and Amber Noble. Luis? Hi there. Um, my name is Luis Chaula. 
I'm an environmental psychologist in the environmental design program at CU. And sometimes my work takes me into research on environmental communication. I just wanted to caution that given the way Proposition 2C was worded, we don't know how many people understood what they were voting about. Um, my husband, who is an intelligent man with a graduate degree, opened his ballot and read 2C. He thought it was asking whether he wanted to get gas and electricity from a utility service. And given the proposition's generic wording, shall the city of Boulder grant a franchise to public service company of Colorado to furnish, sell, and distribute gas and electricity, his response struck me as a reasonable guess. So I talked to about 20 friends and neighbors about 2C, and the responses I got from most of them were, 2C, I have no idea what that's about. What is it about? Or I've been seeing signs about it, and I wondered what it's about. Only three of these people understood proposition, the proposition's backstory. To even estimate what the voting results meant, you'll need to commission focus groups to understand the variety of ways that people interpreted 2C and then send out a survey to a random sample of voters to see how the answers broke down. What proportion of voters understood what, that 2C was about entering into a 20 year contract with Excel and were for it? What, proposite, what proportion understood this and were against it? And what proportion were confused and making creative guesses? Without this information, we're all only guessing ourselves what voters actually intended. Thank you, Luis. Next, we have Chelsea Castellano, Amber Noble, and Evan Ravitz. Chelsea? Hi, my name is Chelsea Castellano, and I'm here tonight to speak to you on the plan to finally implement online signature gathering, an initiative that received overwhelming voter support back in 2018. The proposed ordinance in front of you prohibits ballot initiative campaigns from using the electronic system alongside with traditional physical signature collection. It is absolutely imperative that this component of the ordinance be amended to allow both forms of signature gathering in order to provide campaigns and the community with equitable access to the democratic process. There are many, many people in our community who do not have access to computers or the internet or are simply not computer literate enough to complete the rather elaborate process of signing a petition electronically. Think about your parents or grandparents trying to navigate the complex online process that has been presented to you. On the other hand, as you heard in the presentations earlier this evening, there are many people who are considered high risk for COVID and would not be able to sign an in-person petition due to the potential health risks. Shouldn't both groups have the right to participate in our democracy. The only way to do that is to allow both online and in-person signature collection. And the good news is that you have the authority and opportunity to make that happen. I've heard the city attorney state that the reason to not allow both methods of collection is that it would require more staff time. If that additional workload is insurmountable, then put the onus on the campaigns to do the heavy lifting and type up any in-person signatures collected. That way staff could use that um, to deduplicate between the two lists. Staff would only have to verify that, that the digitized information matched the information on the physical petition. We know this is feasible because um, for campaigns because we typed up every one of the nearly 8,000 signatures we collected earlier this year. In a year with a global pandemic and much uncertainty around what the next several months will look like and also uncertainty around how the new online signature collection process will work for the community, it is imperative that you prioritize equity and don't close doors for participating in the democratic process that could easily remain open. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Amber Noble, <clears throat> Evan Rabbits, and McKaylee Garner. Amber? Amber, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Amber. I am seven, and I am here to talk about the homeless problem. Our town... I am, wait, no. <laughs> I'm really upset about the homeless problem because we're not looking after people 
who need to be looked after, and they're out in the cold by themselves, and they're really lonely, and I've met some of them, and they're really nice, but they have no one to be with, and they're freezing all night long, and it's so cold this winter, and every winter it's so cold in Boulder, and we need to fix this problem, and I'm really sad that no one's trying to fix it. I have, I've prepared some um, ways to help fix it. A bus that drives all around town um, to pick up homeless people and take them to the homeless shelter. And, um, and some more homeless shelters around town, especially around Pearl Street. A program for homeless to get like jobs um, and health care and like food and water and other things like that so that they can stay healthy and like medicine so that they don't die because they're really nice and I think that they they deserve to be looked after and I and I'm really sad that none of us are trying to take care of them. And I think that we should take care of them better. Thank you, Amber. Next, we have Evan Ravitz, McKaylee Garner, and Paul Coleman. Evan? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, Evan Ravitz, North Boulder. City Attorney Tom Carr's Ordinance 8403 puts his fatally flawed design for online petitioning for ballot initiatives into law, creating yet another obstacle to overcome when council finally decides to implement what voter Boulder voted for 71 to 29% over two years ago. The system is far too complicated for most people requiring that users operate the city petitioning website and the state voter registration website and a Google Voice telephone number, as Tom suggested to council, so as not to make your own phone number available to every solicitor and robocaller. We suggested using a postcard or letter to send voters a security code instead of a phone, but Tom declared with no evidence that this was insecure. Actually, Microsoft is now telling people not to use phone or text to send confirmation codes because the phone system is insecure. I've sent the information to council and I made a shortcut to the article you can see at tinyearl.com slash secure codes. We know from many elections that postal ballots work great all across the country. Only Tom and Trump think the postal system is insecure and I believe they both voted by mail. Tom's ordinance also requires petition sponsors to choose online or paper petitions. What responsible person would bet all their organization's time, effort, and resources on a new petition system designed by Tom, a declared enemy of direct democracy that requires users to juggle three websites? Please let us petition both on paper and online and to receive confirmation codes by phone or by mail. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Next we have McKaylee Gardner, Paul Colnan, and Patrick Murphy. McKaylee. There we go. Can you guys hear me now? Yep. We can. All right. Um, hi, I'm McKaylee. And I would like to add getting rid of the camping ban to Amber's list of ideas for the following reasons. First, the threat of police contact undermines the sleep-related health of community members. Lack of uninterrupted sleep increases the likelihood of getting sick after being exposed to a virus, and it increases recovery time. Lack of un uninterrupted sleep is linked to increased rates of mental illness, diabetes, hypertension, drug abuse, and violence. And it's associated with memory loss, increases in anxiety, depression, and schizophrenia-like symptoms. Because the camping ban interferes with some residents' sleep quality, it's detrimental to their physical and mental health. Second, the absence of affordable housing in Boulder. 
puts its residents at risk of violence, which the camping ban exacerbates. Boulder's homeless residents who move often to avoid police contact experience higher rates of sexual assault, physical assault, robbery, and violent threats than those who do not feel forced to move. Women who move often to avoid police contact are 60% more likely to be sexually assaulted than women who don't, and they are 247% more likely to be physically assaulted. Third, the camping ban and similar anti-homeless ordinances do nothing to address the root causes of homelessness. Cycling people through jail doesn't change their behavior, and it doesn't improve public health or safety. Jail isn't a solution, it's an expensive option. It's an attempt to make homelessness invisible and to render people invisible. These extreme measures have destructive impacts on those experiencing homelessness and they cost millions of dollars. Instead of investing in law enforcement, invest in community programs addressing homelessness. Improve those programs instead of unsuccessfully clinging to criminalization. People need to sleep somewhere. If your goal is to keep people from sleeping outside, don't punish them for seeking shelter, provide it. That's what saves lives and businesses. Thank you, McKaylee. Next, we have Paul Cullinan, <clears throat> Patrick Murphy, and Lynn Siegel. Paul? Good evening, Mayor Weaver and council members. My name is Paul Cullinan. I live at 3555 Silver Plum Court in South Boulder. Uh, thank you for including the COVID-19 updates in your meetings. It's uh, good to get that information. I appreciate the efforts of the County Health Department. And thank you, Amber, you give me hope. Um, during this COVID-19 pandemic, we still need to keep some of our attention on global warming. I'm sure you've all seen reports that global warming emissions are lower this year because of the pandemic. The not so good news is that the atmospheric CO2 concentration continues to rise. Think of CO2 in the atmosphere as a thermostat. Study after study has shown that CO2 in the atmosphere acts like a thermostat, a thermostat that on our human time scale only adjusts in one direction, warmer. The small percentage declines in CO2 emissions in 2020 and probably 2021, maybe even 2022, this decline will not lower the thermostat. It just means that the yearly increase of the CO2 thermostat setting is a little bit smaller increase than it was in 2019 still moving the setting up to a slightly warmer temperature year after year. On a geologic time scale, the CO2 concentration goes up and down, but on a human time scale, our concentration only goes up with more emissions. Um, therefore, an 80% solution cutting carbon emissions by 80% doesn't solve anything. That would still be increasing CO2 concentration in the atmosphere just at a slower rate. So it continues to nudge the thermostat up ever warmer temperatures. We've got to stop burning fossil fuels altogether. The sooner we stop burning fossil fuels, the sooner the thermostat setting will stop increasing. The climate can't wait. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Next we have Patrick Murphy, Lynn Siegel, and Alex O'Connor. Patrick? My name is Patrick Murphy. I live in Boulder. Today, I sent you the no muni plan B with equity that would be real and fast carbon reduction. Pay the muni bills, but end any cost of a ghost muni that would eat valuable time and resources like a zombie eats brains. Anything slower than plan B with equity is evidence of insincerity and further erodes trust. The 2011 vote on the muni was 49.6% against the Muni and 50.4% in favor. It's clear which half of the voters were ultimately correct in their gut feeling about a Boulder Muni. 10 years later and five years away from a Muni financial failure, we cried uncle. That painful cry needs to be relieved with real transparency and real carbon reduction for every dollar we spend. No more lawyers, engineers, and Muni administrative hires that don't directly and quickly reduce carbon. There's been an obvious loss of trust and lack of real transparency. Statements by the mayor to the contrary are incorrect. So the original leader of the Muni is gone. The city manager that allowed this to happen is gone. 
The city manager may have done many good things, but the muni will always be an item in the failure column. We need to lose the habit of half-truth and cheerleading as a substitute for logical, pragmatic thinking. That applies to all elements of critical community need today. Darren O'Connor's Saturday camera guest commentary on the homeless is just one other example of that. Regardless of your opinion on the muni, we're now dealt a hand without that joker. I want us to win, but we need to prove progress with facts, not propaganda. Good luck to us. Let fast carbon reduction begin now. Thank you, Patrick. Next we have Lynn Siegel, Alex O'Connor, and Riley Mancuso. Lynn? With municipalization. Thank you, Patrick. That's how we get to the fastest carbon reduction. Um, Lynn Siegel, um, I had something interesting happen lately. Um, when I, can you hear me clearly? Because I wanna know if any problem at all. Um, I uh, protested my property taxes. It's a three level job. It's working against a bunch of lawyers at the Board of Assessment Appeals. And two of my best comparables were interestingly my next door neighbor and another property that both were determined unusable because they were demolition after sale. Now, David Martinez, the county assessor, said that this, what, what this implies is that when there's a demolition, um, all the, you know, this is like an, an eco cycle issue. There's all this, embedded energy in the, in the structure on the property and the removal of that embedded energy and the restoration of the property to a piece of land gets embedded into the property value. This is a problem because so many houses in Boulder are being demoed and I can't use a demo, so my property tax goes up and up and homelessness goes up and up and property value up and up based on each house. Say someone puts up a brand new house and someone doesn't like it, they just demo it. Can't be used as a comp because it gets embedded into the land value. Now, when I bought Thank you, my Lynn. place- Thank you. Next, we have Alex O'Connor, Riley Mancuso, and Ella Fisk. Alex? So Alex is on an older version of Zoom, so I'm going to promote him to panelists briefly for his time to speak with you. We'll just take a moment for him to rejoin the meeting. Hello, can you hear me all right? We, we can. can. Okay. So for as long as I can remember, I've seen homelessness as an issue in Boulder. When I was little, probably around five years old, I didn't understand why people weren't given places to sleep. In first grade, I learned about basic human needs, including shelter. Now, as a freshman in high school, my government class talks about what citizens should expect from the government. And still, people are stuck sleeping outside in the winter. The camping ban in Boulder doesn't even allow people to cover themselves with a blanket. I'm sorry to interrupt, Alex. Can you speak up a little bit and become a little closer to the mic? Because you're very faint, and I want to make sure all the council members can hear you. Can you hear me now? That's a little better, yes. Okay. Thank you. So where was I? The camping ban in Boulder doesn't even allow people to cover themselves with a blanket. According to NOAA, in 2019, the temperatures reached negative 11 degrees Fahrenheit in the Denver area. Every year, people end up in the hospital with hypothermia from sleeping outside. This year, in the midst of a global pandemic, everything is more difficult. Recently, COVID cases have been on the rise in Colorado. This affects everyone in our community right now, and there aren't enough hospital beds. We need to help people before they need emergency care. The pandemic highlights the need for change in how Boulder deals with homelessness, and we can choose to make the change that will help the community even beyond this year of crisis. Even as a young child, I saw this as an issue. A few years ago, I went to a protest on National Homelessness Awareness Day. I wanted to help however I could, 
and I got to meet lots of people who are homeless in Boulder. I collected rocks with them and I snuggled with their dogs. Let's not fall into the trap of believing stereotypes. These are people with their own stories and they aren't scary, they're just trying to survive. Thank you, Alex. Next, we have Riley Mancuso, Ella Fisk, and Julie Zahnheiser. Riley? Please just give me just a moment to get Alex back as an attendee, and then I will um, find Riley in the meeting. Okay, Riley, you'll need to unmute. Uh, uh, hey. Uh, hi, Council. How's it going? Uh, it's Riley here. Um, I really want to second everything that Amber and McKaylee and Alex said. Please, I'm urging you to stop enforcement of the camping ban um, for all of the reasons that have been well articulated. It really runs counter to all the stated goals of public safety and health. It's really detrimental to the people being targeted by the police. It's a waste of public money, yada, yada, yada. You all know this. We all know that the camping ban is a is only being enforced as a cave to wealthy, entitled uh, landowning boulderites who don't wanna see poor people. And we know that it's part of Kurt Fernhaber's xenophobic campaign to force people out of Boulder the same way that Trump is trying to get people to self-deport across the southern border, um, which is relevant because homeless people are seven times more likely to be indigenous in Boulder than the general population of the city um, and much more likely to be Black, uh, Latino, or immigrants. Um, so, and that brings me to, I want to address uh, Mayor Weaver's comments earlier about the need for gentleness and about the uh, fucking like microaggression seminar or whatever. And over a year ago when uh, Councilwoman Nagel made her comments about the struggle of the white man that were like grossly insensitive and whatever, I called you all out for paying more attention to your words than your actions. And you don't seem to have learned anything from that because it doesn't matter if you address your microaggressions when you're still committing macroaggressions on a scale with your policy and sending violent police to, you know, even if they're not physically cutting up people's tents and evicting them, although they do that, if they walk up with their hands on their taser and on their gun, that is the threat of violence. How is that gentleness? Why do you deserve gentleness when people who are freezing out on the street right now struggling to survive apparently don't? Um, you know what? Fix your hearts or die. Peace. Thank Thank you, Riley. So it does not appear that Ella Fisk is with us. Ella, if I you're here. I do see a Leah Fisk, and I'm wondering if that may be the individual. So if it's okay with you, Sam, I will um, put that person on and see if that's Ella. Sure. I just noticed that name in the list, so. Thank you. Yes, hi, I'm Lee, and my daughter is Ella, and she's here okay. in Ray. Hello, City Council. I'm Ella Fisk, and I live in Boulder. Today, I'm speaking about the issue of the homeless camping ban. I know it is against the Constitution to be cruel to homeless people by keeping them from using blankets and tents when sleeping outside. I know there are 441 homeless people in Boulder. I think we should help homeless people by making more shelters. Another solution is to help homeless people find houses. I wonder why it is against the law to sleep outside with a blanket or tent. Please let homeless people use blankets when sleeping outside. Please help homeless people find shelter. Most of them are nice. They can be mean like most people, but they can be nice like most people too. Homeless people deserve to be treated better. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ella. Next, we have Julie Zonheiser, Tanvi Kapoor, and Chris Hoffman. Julie? Hi, hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, good evening, Mayor Weaver and council members. My name is Julie Zonheiser. I live in South Boulder. I hope you had a Thanksgiving break and are managing with COVID. I would like to make a few suggestions regarding climate change in relation to the city manager search process. In my opinion, the Novak Consulting Group City Manager position profile has omitted two important issues that need to be conveyed up front and with gravity. The first is climate change. The profile needs to express Boulder's strong 
community-wide commitment to immediate action to address our climate emergency. Any candidate needs to be in alignment with and committed to working hard to achieve Boulder's energy goals detailed on the city website, including 100% renewable energy by 2030. The second relates to section 64G of our city charter, the city manager's responsibility to see that, quote, all franchise rights and provisions are justly enforced, end quote. The position profile needs, in my opinion, to some way convey the current, the current opportunity and enormous challenge in our city manager's executive responsibilities in this respect of protecting our community. Here are two examples to consider during your internal vetting process. City manager candidates need to be in alignment with franchise agreement and partnership guiding principles and goals, which are spelled out in section one. City manager candidates need to have the temperament and tenacity to hold their own in their environment energy partnership agreement governance role as a crucial member of the executive team, which is responsible for oversight of the partnership agreement. That's in section two. And that includes, among other things, having the resolve to support decarbonization programs to meet our goals to ensure that Article 8 performance obligations are met in a timely manner and to communicate regularly to you and the community. Thank you so much for your hard work and for your consideration. Thank you, Julie. Next, we have Tanvi Kapoor, Chris Hoffman, and Holly Carlson. Tanvi? Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, council members. I'm an international student studying at CU Boulder. Today, I would like to share my thoughts on what are two sides of the same coin, and that is abundance and subsequent wastage. We all are aware that COVID has increased food, housing, and economic hardships in our community. While we all have gone to great lengths to live and work in a virtual world, however, we are lagging behind in our efforts to save the real world from threats posed by this abundance and subsequent wastage. In the current time, Working or studying in isolation has led to increase in food hoarding, use of single-use materials and plastic bags, thus threatening the possibility of sustainable existence. During my few social visits to different households here in Boulder, so far of, and of relatively new residents like me, I noticed there was lack of awareness as to what goes into trash and what goes into a recycle bin. Even at my own residential complex, there was very little information available for the residents regarding how to and what to discard as waste. Um, also during my recent visit to a pumpkin farm provoked my thoughts about food wastage. It's true that during holidays, we see maximum food wastage, which may result due to mass overproduction of produce or and livestock or by overbuying of perishables. I really appreciate that Boulder County has some good plans and regulations in place to promote sustainable existence. Thus, I have few more advisories, uh, advice, uh, and I humbly request city council to spread more awareness amongst residents, such as not to hoard food, more awareness in residential communities, sharing of excess food with food pantries and food share organizations, composting of food waste, and making landfills as a last resort. So the generation of additional awareness uh, along with an adoption of such practices by residents of Boulder could make the community at large a better place and give a collective sense of purpose. Thank you so much and wishing you all a very happy new year in advance. Thank you. Thank you, Tanvi. <clears throat> Rachel, I see your hand up. Is this something you'd like to say now? You're muted. Drat. Um, I can wait until after uh, staff speaks in, in okay. response to anything. Okay, super. Um, next, we have Chris Hoffman and Harley, Holly Carlson. Chris. Thank you. I really appreciate your work, council members and Mayor Weaver on behalf of our community. And regardless of how one voted on the Excel franchise in the recent election, it's reasonable to assume that for those who understood the measure, the difference between a yes vote and a no vote was one of methodology not of goal. The yes on 2C website said the partnership agreement, quote, enables 100% renewables and does it faster than going it alone. The no on 2C group argued that staying out of franchise would be a better way to get to the same goal. 
All these voters, whether they voted yes or no, voted to support Boulder's goal of 100% renewable electricity by 2030. Now that Excel is going to be our partner in reaching these goals, it is incumbent on city council to manage the partnership proactively. Please require Excel to deliver promptly and publicly to the citizens of Boulder the following three Ds, deliverables, due dates, and dollars. Deliverables. These are specific commitments for a defined glide path adequate to deliver 100% renewable electricity to Boulder by 2030, including a list of sources of renewable energy and specific implementation steps. These deliverables should come with associated due dates, milestone dates by year and quarter for when each of these deliverables will be put into service and begin providing electricity to Boulder, and also dollars. The estimated cost for each project and or source of renewable electricity with a total estimated cost for the entire glide path to 100% renewables by 2030, as well as Excel's and Boulder's agreement about who will pay for which part of each project and the identified sources of funding for each. And we expect this all to be open and transparent to the public. Climate can't wait. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> and we have one last speaker, Holly Carlson. Um, Sarah tells me that there is no Holly Carlson in the meeting. So Sarah, do you want to check on the phone? Sure, we do have one person who's on the phone line. So I'm going to turn that person on to see if that might be um, Ms. Carlson. If you are calling in on the phone line, it starts with 561. If you could unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. Is this Holly Carlson by any yes, chance? This is. Okay. Yes, this is. I was having some difficulty trying to get onto the Zoom line. So no worries. Good evening, good evening, City Council. My name is Holly Carlson. I'm a transplant to Boulder, Colorado, going on six years. I'm also a single mom who lives in affordable housing here in town. I'm here today speaking on behalf of our local environment and native wildlife. In the last three years, I have watched an influx of encampments become ever so noticeable in and around Boulder, especially in our open spaces next to our local water systems. Even more so in the last eight months, which has been extremely detrimental to not only the environment, but also the water quality. Especially when speaking about our waterfowl who use these rivers as their roads and nesting sites. Now I understand that the subject of homelessness here in Boulder is a sensitive issue. However, Boulder's environment and the species who have called this home long before humans are being put at the back burner and made to suffer year after year. My question is, how can we be putting the environment and the wildlife last on the list of importance when these are the very things that people from all over the world come to Boulder, Colorado to see? You cannot hide the massive amounts of trash, fecal matter, drug paraphernalia, or stolen property thrown around all around these encampments. You cannot hide the camp being built in the city's culverts that were designed to move large amounts of water under the roads and highways safely. These are areas that are clearly marked no trespassing, yet these individuals are allowed to stay there for months at a time, which is both unsafe for humans and the environment. This is not a situation where you can put your blinders on or wait to worry about it in the next year. Our environment and wildlife have already suffered enough in 2020 between the fires and the damage done by these encampments. So before it's too late, I ask that the city council along with Boulder PD and the homeless outreach program come together and start to address this issue. As I implore all of you to go buy an over the counter water bacteria test at your local Home Depot and go test the waters by your homes and these encampments. And you too will see the real damage that is truly being done as I would not swim or have my children near or in these waters after starting these tests for personal knowledge. Lastly, I just want to extend my gratitude to the Boulder PD for their ongoing efforts to find balance and doing so with dignity. I hope that the Boulder community as a whole can find solutions and start the process of getting our environment cleaned up and back to the pristine condition in which it should be. I thank you for your time, City Council and Chief Harold. Thank you, Holly. Okay, with that, we are done with open comment and I will close it and turn to staff. Chris, Tom, do you have anything to respond? Nothing for me tonight. Nor from me, Sam. Thank you. Very good. Rachel? Yep. Uh, just a couple things. I wanted to particularly thank Ella and Amber for attending tonight's meeting and speaking and um, invite them to share their list. There's a, a way to email city council and we are always looking for um, 
new ideas. So please stay in touch. And I think it's cool that seven-year-olds were here speaking tonight. So thank you for being here. Um, and then second, there was a comment about staff being uh, xenophobic. And I just want to state that from my perspective, um, I think staff carries out our um, directives. And so I think that um, criticism lies with me and my colleagues. So um, I don't find that staff member to be xenophobic, but I also just want to put it out there that um, I, I would rather absorb the criticism than have it lobbed at staff because they are um, acting according to our um, decisions. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. And I'll just follow up and amplify that by saying when I'm putting out the idea that we can treat each other with respect and kindness, um, it especially does apply to staff. Uh, we're your elected representatives. So if you do have a problem with what staff is doing, um, the responsibility does lie with council. And so um, I would follow up with what Rachel said and say that um, look at staff as human beings. And if you need to um, get staff to correct their actions, that responsibility lies with council. Um, Junie. Thank you, Sam. Um, I'm not sure if even to us, some of the comments are warranted because I know some of you have been called really bad names and I'm not sure if they are really true because calling someone xenophobic, do you have the facts? Or are you just saying, just throwing things and hopefully something stick or you just wanna be outrageous. And I just don't think that that's the best way to get, I guess, or policy forward if we're really trying to make a difference in the community. So I think being mean is just not very effective at getting anyone closer to where you would like them to be. But I just wanted to add earlier, I think Ember's comments, they really touched me. Ember Noble, I think your comments were really noble. And, you know, I just, when I was seven, you know, I wasn't thinking about, you know, making the world a better place. I was just thinking, I guess, maybe as a child. So I really appreciate the comments. And I have thought about them as well when it comes to, because I think she mentioned transportation, um, bringing homeless um, people in homeless situation, bringing them to the shelter. But I think there are a lot of challenges to that as well. Um, I think we do that when it comes to, you know, bringing them from one shelter area to the, to the next, when, when we had the severe weather shelter, right? But as far as picking them up, I think my, my experience has been, I've walked, you know, the path. A lot of the people who are homeless, they have a lot of property with them. So I think also, I think there's a lot more to it than just having transportation to bring them to one site. Um, and I think maybe um, Kurt can say more about that, the HAT team. And I think they do a lot of work in the community when it comes to outreach with the homeless people. But I think everything that you said were really well thought of. And I think that's a conversation we definitely need to have, I guess, continue to have in our community because we've been having this conversation. So thank you for making those comments and they really touched me. And I think it was uh, both Ella and, 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 and Ember. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny. I don't see any other hands up. So with that, um, Debbie, take us to the next. Okay, next is our consent agenda, items A through G. Very good. And I think there are two items in particular that we expected to touch on. So I'll call those out. Council members can raise any others. One of those is uh, item 3D, which is the extension of the oil and gas moratorium until the end of the year. Um, Tom, do you wanna to touch on that? Sure, Sam, thank you. This is um, a continuation of the oil and gas moratorium the city has had in place, uh, I believe since 2013. Uh, the city's oil and gas uh, moratorium is, ex is being extended at this time because the county is in the process of developing regulations for oil and gas, uh, and we uh, don't wanna have anything uh, going on in Boulder. Boulder is blessed by not really having any oil, uh, and the uh, oil and gas moratorium is drafted so that uh, we don't actually prohibit oil and gas drilling. We prohibit the application for a permit to do so, uh, and so someone to challenge it would have to actually have 
a, a right to apply for a permit. And I'm not aware of any oil and gas that's developable in Boulder at this time. So this extends it to the end of the year and we will, can staff will, will continue to work on this and bring back something back to council later in the year. Very so good. This is 20, the, the end of 2021, of course. That's what I was guessing. Thank you. Um, and then the other item is 3E that we are going to touch on, and that is the approval of the franchise with Excel Energy. So uh, again, Chris or Tom, one of you. Sure. Chris, do you want to do it or do you want me to? Um, if you want to do it, and then uh, I think Steve is available to answer any questions as well. Sure. There was some confusion in some emails today. I want to clarify what this is. Um, there, there, there was, uh, Leslie Glustrom raised the question of the ordinance number. Uh, she referred to ordinance 8410, which I believe was the ordinance that placed the uh, franchise on the ballot. The charter has a separate provision that requires council after it's approved by the voters to approve the franchise. This ordinance is a separate for ordinance from the one that placed it on the ballot, which is why the numbers were different as raised in Ms. Glustrom's email. The uh, requirement of the charter is that there be 60 days between first and second reading of a, fran a franchise approval. Council did first reading on, on this, I believe in September. Uh, this is second reading for tonight. It is a ministerial act. It is a predicate to having the PUC consider approval of the franchise. Uh, Excel is required to have PUC approval of any franchise it enters into. This is a requirement on Excel, not on the city. The PUC rules require that Excel submit a certified copy of the franchise approved by the governing body. So for, for the PUC to consider approval, that the council will need to approve it. Very good, thank you. And I guess I have a question on that. <clears throat> what happens if the PUC doesn't approve it? And that has two flavors, I guess. One is they outright reject it. And then the second is they make um, changes which are minor or substantive. How can we deal with that? Well, any, ch any change except ministerial ones would have to be approved by the voters. So if the PUC were to change it or reject it and want a different franchise, you do not have the authority to enter into a franchise. You have the authority to enter into a franchise that was approved by the voters. So unless it is approved in substantially this form, and I mean pretty clearly substantially the same form, the, the voters, we would have to bring anything changes back to the voters. Uh, th that's my view. Uh, so, so you could um, you could state that in your motion. If you like. David Gear has drafted some language that I can get to you that uh, would add that as a, a clear statement. So anybody is reassured that the PUC isn't going to change what the voters have approved. Great, and from my standpoint, I think that additional language would be helpful. Do you wanna read it or put it up on the screen? If, um, Sarah, do I have permission to share my screen? Sarah may have taken a break. I'll just try to do it or read it if I can. One second. I just gave you permission, Tom. You should be able to share. Okay. Um, I'm sharing now. We can't see it yet. Yep, I'm pulling it up. Super. So the motion... The city moves to declare that if the P Colorado Public Utilities Commission requires any material change or amendments to the franchise agreement as part of its approval process, any such changes or amendments will require subsequent voter approval as required by city charter section 108 and 114. Very good. So that looks good to me. And I'll just suggest that um, when we move the uh, sorry, when we move the consent agenda that we say as amended. Um, for item 3D. Thank you. Very good. Bob? Yeah, uh, Tom, just on that language, um, is the word, is the adjective material meant to apply to both changes and, and amendment? Can you pull that back up again? Of course. It, I, I believe it is, uh, Bob, but let me pull it back up for you. And in the first um, line, would you mind humoring me and in, in inserting the word material before amendments also, just so there's no 
Um, no one would come back and later argue that it was material changes or any amendments. It's material changes or material amendments, if that's your intention. It, it sounds okay with that. Yep, I'm good. Okay. We, so Thanks. that will be incorporated into the motion of adopting the consent agenda. And I'll make sure the clerk has this language. Very good. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, David, for humoring me on that. It's appreciated. And I meant item 3E as, as what would be amended. Okay, so that's everything that we had flagged ahead of time as uh, potentially being an issue. I see no other hands. So, uh, Mark. I'm sorry, but I, I do have one rather, it's almost an odd question, and it's relating to Ordinance 8434, the Construction Use Tax Reconciliation. Um, it, if I read the materials correctly, 98.7% of the revenue we generate through those um, uh, reconciliations comes from permits in excess of $100,000. And so my question is, why didn't we simply make that the threshold for, um, for this statute? Why are we doing it at $75,000 um, when there are only a few permits that are at that level and they don't generate very much money? Wouldn't it have just been easier to do it at 100,000? And I guess that's a question for staff. Sure. Uh Good evening, Council. Joel Wagner, Tax and Special Projects Manager. Uh, frankly, we, we debated $75,000 or $100,000. Uh, after looking at the data, we felt that um, the $75,000 was a pretty clear break, break point where there was no value added to reconciling permits. And then when we hit that $75,000 threshold, um, there was more variance and, and revenue associated with it. Uh, so it felt to us like a um, just a, a, a clear point where uh, there is some some reconciliations that produce revenue and also produce more uh, refunds. So look, I leave it to your discretion and your call, but it looks like to me that that where uh, the lower amount simply generates 1.1 percent of the revenue. It just didn't seem to make sense to me. But as I said, I defer to you on that. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Aaron. Yeah, I just wanted to mention um, that uh, some community members have brought up some concerns around the electronic petitioning ordinance. Uh, just to flag that, yeah, I look forward to the discussion. We might consider some amendments when we get there, but I'll leave it for a second reading. Good enough. Um, Bob, I see your hand again. I was gonna, uh, if there were no other questions or comments, I was going to move the consent agenda. I move the consent agenda um, with the with the um, amendments to item 3E that, that Sam and Tom and I just discussed. Second. Very good. We have a motion and a second. And Debbie, I believe this is a roll call, correct? Yes, it is. Council Member Young. Yes. Hmm. Rocket. Aye. Friend. Yep. Joseph. Y yes. Uh, Sweatlick. Aye. Wallach. Aye. Weaver. Aye. Yates. Aye. Um, it's an eight, eight to zero vote, so it's unanimous. Very good. Okay, and next. Next on the agenda, we have um, your call-up check-in, which is a call-up consideration for the application to rename Wonderland Lake to the Wonderland Lake Wildlife Sanctuary. Very good. Um, council, does anyone have any comments or desire to call it up? Aaron? No, I have no desire to call it up. I just want to call out that um, the renaming is a product of a lot of residents uh, who care very much about that area. We wanted to brand it with a, a special name, recognizing the wonderful wildlife out there. It's one of my favorite haunts. I live nearby and walk there often. So just appreciate all the citizen effort that went into this and look forward to uh, not calling it up so that it goes through. Very good. I see no one else and see no desire to call it up. So I think we're ready to move on. Okay, next we have our first public hearing, which is the consideration of a site review amendment to the 29th Street Shopping Center to adaptively reuse and redesign the existing Macy's department store 
located at 1928th Street in the Business Regional One Zoning District as an office and retail building. Great, thank you, Council, for our first public hearing tonight. Um, Elaine McLaughlin, a senior planner and PNDS, will be the um, staff member who will present this item. Before we go to that, um, Tom Carr will cover the quasi-judicial procedures. Um, but I think actually before that, because um, we have one council member absent, I think Sam, you wanted to say some words here at the beginning of this item. So I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I guess I wanted to flag that um, one possible uh, complication of having a even number of people sitting um, to rule on the site review amendment um, hearing, the site plan review hearing in front of us would be that we could conceivably come to a point where we have a four to four vote. And that would create a situation where um, we could have a, a complicated resolution and some issues of what was moved, how it was moved. And um, also this is a fairly big project and to have less than a full council hear it um, seems like that might not be ideal. So I wanted to turn first to the applicant um, if the, the reason there's a, there's a council person missing tonight who um, <clears throat> can be at a future um, potential deliberation. So one possible pathway forward would be to have the presentation. Um, and so the staff presentation, applicant presentation, council questions, public hearing, and then continue the hearing to another evening to have deliberations and a resolution uh, decision made on approval or denial of the site plan review application. So I will turn first to the applicant and see if the applicant would be comfortable with us going through the entire presentation and hearing and then uh, continuing the hearing and making a decision at a future point or and that future point would be probably the first or second meeting in the new year. Um, so I'll turn to the representative for the applicant and see if that would be acceptable before I go to council, because if the applicant doesn't want to do it, I think we'll just proceed with um, an eight person council. So Chris, I do think we want I need to promote a couple of applicants so that they can respond to your question. If you'll bear with me for a moment, I have a list and I'll go through it right now. You bet. I guess while we're waiting, I will point out that we had a couple, we had an eight person council after one of our members resigned. Um, and we had that eight person council through most of um, 2019, and it, it created some complications. Um, uh, we had a couple of 4-4 four, four votes, which meant motions failed. So I was just anticipating that that could be an outcome. Don't know if it would be, and that's why I wanted to bring this up. I believe I've promoted everybody on my list who's got a name similar to the names I was given. So hopefully somebody can respond to your question. Hmm. So if you're present and you would like to respond to that, you can either raise your hand or just unmute yourself and let us know. Hi, this is Charlie Smith. I'm a, an attorney at Brownstein Height, Farber and Shrek. I, I can speak on behalf of the applicant. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to do so. We understand there's been a request by council to continue our public hearing. And we would like to accommodate uh, the participation of all nine members of council we understand that there's been a last minute emergency that's come up that's uh, precluded her participation and something we uh, completely understand. Given the nature of the project, we believe it would be best to have uh, the full presentation and the decision occur on the same night. Uh, I would think that that allows for a more robust dialogue with council and a more fully informed decision by every member of council that's based on the record. Um, We'd agree with our hearing being continued to sometime in the next 30 days. And more specifically, we'd request that it be at the December 8th special meeting, which is obviously when uh, council will all be uh, uh, available. Uh, we'd prefer that this not be continued into next year, given that we were originally scheduled for a planning board hearing in March. Uh, and we chose to hold off on that in the hopes that we could have 
an in-person hearing. Obviously, that didn't happen because uh, of the continuing spread of COVID. Uh, and so we opted to move forward with a remote hearing, but we'd still like to have a public hearing with the presentation and the decision on the same night uh, to keep things as normal as possible. Uh, of course, we're ready to give our presentation tonight if council would prefer to hold that meeting and, and the vote uh, as well tonight. Um, otherwise, we'd consent to the rescheduling of the hearing to a date certain in the next 30 days. And we'd respectfully request that that be on December 8th at your next meeting. So just to be clear, December 8th is not a regular meeting. It is not even a special meeting at this point. It is a study session. So, um, and it is not clear um, from conversations with the missing council member that they would be available on December 15th. So if there were to be a rescheduling, it would likely be on January the um, 5th. And so that that would be probably the earliest that could happen. Um, and it is, it is your choice that's not within 30 days. So the rules, just to make sure that we're all clear on it, people watching and council members, if we start a public hearing tonight, um, that's within your 60 day window um, that you're from the um, planning board disposition. And then once we start the public hearing, we have a discretion to not make a decision for up to 30 days. So that would be through December 31st if we start tonight. I, my expectation is if we go forward tonight, there will end up being a vote. If we go forward tonight and you do not want to um, continue just the decision part, then I think we'll just go forward tonight with an eight person council um, if you don't want to split it into two parts. Uh, it, it sounded like January 5th might be an option, and it, uh, I think we're all fine with that on our end. If we were able to have the presentation and the decision on that same night, it just seems important to have them together to have that, you know, one cohesive conversation with all the members of council so we can all be answering questions consistently and um, having that dialogue. Okay, so I'll bring it back to council. <clears throat> I will point out for everyone, including the Macy's team, that uh, the planning board has done this, at least in my experience, a couple of times where you have the um, presentation and questions and public hearing at one session and then at another session there's deliberation potential future questions and a decision is taken so coming back to council um council i guess the the question if i understood correctly from the applicant is we could try and reschedule everything to january 5th i know that we'd we'd have a full council there, at least as far as I know. Um, the fifth has some items that could be moved off and I know we have space on the 19th from our last CAC meeting. So that's one option. And another option is to go forward and do everything tonight. So um, it looks like the applicant preference is not to split it into two different evenings. So I think we need to work with either tonight or the fifth. It sounds like either one is acceptable to the applicant. So I have Bob, Adam, Mark, and Aaron. Bob? Well, I, I uh, very much appreciate the flexibility of the applicant. Um, and January 5th um, is only a few, few days outside of 30 days from now. And so I really appreciate the applicant being flexible. I agree with the applicant that it does make sense to have the presentation, the public hearing, and the decision all at the same time. Otherwise, we have that awkward situation where eight of us will have heard directly and had a, a chance to ask uh, questions. And then one of our colleagues will have to watch it by video and will not have an opportunity to participate. So my preference would be if it's okay with the applicant to move this all to January 5th, when we all can be together, can listen to the presentation, can um, hear the testimony, ask questions and then make a decision uh, that night. So that would be my preference. Very good, thank you. Adam? My only input is I think the future is an unknown, so we're not any more certain than we are right now that we'll have a ninth council member or not on January 5th. Emergencies happen, so. Thank you. Uh, Mark, Aaron, and Rachel. Mark? Yeah, I would want to uh, accommodate the applicant and move this to January 5th. Uh, I would prefer to have a full council available and for all of us to um, be able to receive the benefits of the hearing uh, and then make a decision you know, immediately thereafter rather than bifurcating it. And if that is the applicant's preference, I think we ought to uh, accommodate them. 
Very good. Aaron and then Rachel. Aaron? Yeah, I agree with, with Mark and Bob. I think there, it, it does help to have it all together. And I appreciate the applicant's uh, flexibility in accommodating uh, council members' schedules. And hopefully we can all um, do our very best short of, um, of, a, of a big emergency to be there in that first meeting in January. Thank you, Aaron. Rachel? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, like, do we have a sense that Mirabai is available on January 5th? Like yeah, I, spoke, I spoke with her after I got the text and she's fairly uncertain that she can make the 15th of this month. So that's very dicey. Um, but the 5th, she promised that she would be available for 5th of okay. January. Uh, so I'm a little bit with Adam, like, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Like, it's, you know, it's hard to say that January 5th, everybody's well in attending. So that, I don't know, it does feel a little bit like rolling the dice, but I, I just wondered like if, uh, and this is probably a question to Tom, if we were to move forward tonight and it would only be relevant, I assume if we got to a 4-4 vote, what would happen then? Like, What's the outcome of a 4-4 vote on, in this situation? The the code is not clear. The code on uh, section 944 of the, the revised code provides for your call-up authority. It says that you need to make a decision either to approve or deny, and that the decision uh, either to approve or deny must be, be supported by uh, findings, specific findings. Uh, there is no provision for what happens if you don't make a decision. Uh, the, if, if this were a court and it, you tied 4-4, I would advise that the, the, you, what the court's process is that the lower court's decision stays intact. Um, there is no precedent for this, so there is some risk. It, it, either way, you could also argue that a 4-4 tie uh, would uh, result in a denial because you haven't approved it and you've called it up. Uh, so I could argue it either way. Uh, the code, as I said, contemplates a decision by council. And as Sam noted, planning board has done this. Planning board actually has a charter provision that requires four, four members to be in agreement to take action. So they have this problem with, with more frequency and they have a specific provision. There is nothing for council other than language saying that you act by a majority. And could council say, we're 4-4, four, four. we're going to continue this until we have all nine here. And I understand that's not what the, app, the applicant would prefer, that all nine be there for the whole thing, but it seems only relevant in the event that we get to 4-4. Four, four. Could we make, then continue? The code requires you to make a decision within 30 days of the beginning of the public hearing. So okay. you, as a matter of your right, continue it as, as long as you make a decision and publish your findings within 30 days. But not to January 5th, which is the next time we expect the ninth council member to be in attendance. That That's is the correct. glitch. And the for, for to go to January 5th, the applicant would have to agree. Okay. Thank you. And I'll just point out <clears throat> in that scenario, it, it is not clear that we would be allowed to take another vote, right? So if we tied four to four, that would be a vote that would have some meaning potentially. Um, but as Tom says, we're in unexplored territory. So I think the safer thing to do to avoid any confusion um, would be to go to January 5th. Seems like it's okay with the applicant. Um, and, and so uh, unless there's objections, Adam, I see your hand, uh, but unless there's objections, I'm where Bob and Mark are on this and Aaron, I think um, there is some uncertainty, but we know for sure that we won't have nine tonight and probably not on the 15th, but likely we will on the 5th. Adam? Not an objection, but just generally, you know, it's, I think it's in poor taste to schedule public hearings and then not hold them. And, uh, you know, that doesn't sit well. So um, trying to avoid that, I realize again, emergencies happen, but I mean, this is our job. I hear you. If if it weren't for the prospect of us ending up in a hung situation where no one knows exactly what that means, I would agree with you. Um, in this in this case, I think it's probably prudent not to take that chance. Bob. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you that normally, if if this was a, um, a relatively minor matter, we would just simply go forward and 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 we would decide whatever we decide. This is I, I'm going to say that this is probably one of the larger items that we're going to handle this um, year. Um, and it has been our tradition, at least in the past, uh, that um, on larger items, we try to accommodate missing council members and, and not make decisions in their absence, whether that absence is scheduled in advance or that absence, in this case, 
is an emergency. So I, I think we try, we try to be deferential to missing council members and uh, you know, life happens. And um, if this wasn't one of the larger um, questions of the year, I would probably tend to agree with you, but this is a, a pretty, uh, an item of, of great interest to the community and to the applicant, of course. And I think it's, uh, it's worthy of having all nine of us in the room for that. Okay, well, that sounds mostly like consensus to me. I'm going to turn to Chris and Elaine, make sh and I guess Chris, Charles, and Elaine, make sure that you guys are comfortable with that. I feel like we have enough room, if I recall correctly, later in January that we can accommodate this change, but I'd love to hear from you before we go forward. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, I think we're, we can accommodate this. Uh, um, folks are available on January 5th, and um, we can bring a uh, a shuffle to the council agendas to CAC on Monday uh, to, to try and make it work. Okay, very good. Charles, Elaine, anything else? Nothing from staff. Okay, very good. So Aaron, I see your hand. Well, I was just gonna ask if we need a, a motion of some kind to make this happen. And I'll turn to Tom to answer I would, that. I would prefer a motion to continue to January 5th or to reschedule. To reschedule. No, not to continue because you haven't started. Could someone make the motion? Bob? Uh, I move the council direct CAC to uh, reschedule this matter for uh, our council meeting on January 5th. Second. Okay, any objections? All right, can we also make sure that the applicant will, will you state affirmatively that you do not object? Macy's team. No objections. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. If I see no objections, I'll call this a unanimous vote. I see none. This is an eight zero vote to move um, item 5A to January 5th, and we'll work on everything else at CAC. So thank you, and apologies for the late notice to everyone. And especially to the public, anyone who wanted to speak at the public hearing tonight, I am sorry to juggle this at the last minute. Okay, um, Debbie, what's next? Um, next, we have our sub second public hearing, which is the certification of the 2020 coordinated municipal election. Perfect, thank you. Pam Davis, who uh, has served as our designated election official for this last election, um, will be the one to cover this item. I did also want to acknowledge that um, it, it appears there was a glitch in some of the materials. So the, the memo was added very late to the packet. Um, so there is a memo that's in there, but Pam is going to walk uh, council through each of the steps um, to be able to certify the election. Good evening, Mayor Weaver and members of council. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm Pam Davis, assistant city manager, and I served as the designated election official for 2020. I do have a couple of slides to walk us through this process. Um, so Emily, I'd appreciate it if you could bring up the presentation. So as I begin, I also just wanna acknowledge the great efforts of our elections administrator, Diane Marshall, who was instrumental in the success of this year's election. So please advance to the next slide. The process to go ahead and certify the 2020 election results is a little bit different than a traditional public hearing. So I thought I'd just give council and the public a very brief outline of what needs to happen for this to get done. And then we think that it will move along fairly expeditiously. So, at, so that you are aware, the city council also serves as a distinct entity, which is the general canvassing and election board and I will be serving as the secretary for that board this evening. And so to proceed, you, we will follow the steps that you see on the slide. First, we'll convene as a board, take a roll call and administer an oath of office. We are also required to have each council member sign the oath. Given the challenges of our virtual environment, Diane Marshall will be reaching out to you tomorrow morning to arrange for those signatures for the record. The next order of business at that point will be for the board to appoint a chair of the board Historically, the chair has been the mayor and we recommend his appointment by acclamation, but as a board, you will have an opportunity to nominate and approve your selection shortly. Following the appointment of the chair, I will briefly present our results and ask that the chair open a public hearing. Upon conclusion of that hearing, the board will have one remaining motion to approve the election 
returns and to adjourn the general canvassing and election board to reconvene city council. Uh, and so to begin this process, um, I'd appreciate a motion to convene as the general canvassing and election board for the city of Boulder coordinated municipal election held on November 3rd, 2020. So moved. Second. Great, we have a motion and a second. So does anyone object? Seeing none, Pam, I think we're convened and back to you. Okay, great, thank you very much. So the next step is for me to go ahead and take a roll call. And as we are convened as a board, you are all now board members. Um, so board member Brockett. Board. I, what do I have to do exactly? Sorry, this I, is just the roll call. Just here. roll call vote. Okay, just for attendance I, purposes. Correct. No, here, here. <laughs> here. There we go. Attendance. How about that? Present. <laughs> here. Thank you. <laughs> board member Friend. I am here. Board member Joseph. Present. Board member Nagel. Board member Swetlick. Here. Board member Wallach. Here. Board member Weaver. Here. Board member Yates. Here. And board member Young. Present. Great, thank you all. So our next activity is um, to go ahead and administer an oath of office for this elections board. And so um, due to our virtual environment, I'm going to go ahead and read the oath out loud myself. And we'll just ask at the end for all of you to state I do that you commit to this oath of office. So we, the undersigned, do solemnly swear or affirm that we will perform the duties of the general canvassing and election board for the coordinated municipal election held in the city of Boulder, county of Boulder, state of Colorado on the third day of November, 2020, according to the law and to the best of my ability. So please state, I do to accept this oath. I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. Thank you very much. So moving right along, we now need a nomination to identify the board chair for this meeting. Historically, this is the mayor. May I ask for one bit of clarification? I don't mean to slow this down, but it mentions the third day of November. So that's referencing the date of the election. Is that correct? That's correct. Very good. Thank you. Um, I'll I'll, I'll make a motion that we uh, uh, nominate uh, Sam Weaver to chair the board. Second. Great. Any objections? Very good. By acclamation. Back to you, Pam. Great. Thank you. So, uh, Chairman Weaver, uh, you have been accepted as the board chair. So as the secretary for the board, um, we have presented to you in the late addition to the packet this afternoon, the statement of votes, the summary of votes, the Boulder County Audit Reconciliation Report and Certification, as well as the Statement of Election Results and Certification for the Colorado Department of Local Affairs. And if we could move to the next slide now, I will briefly present the final results of the 2020 election for the city ballot measures. The ballot measures were as follows. To be no eviction without representation passed uh, with about a 59% approval. To see the public service company franchise also passed with a, roughly a 53% majority approval. 2D, repurposing the utility occupation tax passed with a majority of about 57%. 2E, charter amendments related to direct election of the mayor passed with a majority of about 78%. And 2F, the amendment related to the Boulder Arts Commission passed with a majority of roughly 85%. The official results as well as additional historical information and greater detail is available on the Boulder County Elections website. So at this stage, uh, Chair Weaver, if you would be willing to convene the public hearing for this item, that would be our next step. Very good. I will open a public hearing. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, Debbie, we have no one signed up. Is that correct? That is correct. Very good. Seeing no one interested in the public hearing, I will close the public hearing. Great. Thank you very much. And so our final step in this process to certify this matter is to consider a motion 
to approve the election returns for the City of Boulder coordinated municipal election held on November 3rd, 2020, and then to adjourn from the general canvassing and election board and reconvene as the Boulder City Council. So moved. Second. Very good. We have a motion and a second. Is there any objection to the motion? Seeing none, that passes unanimously and we're reconvened as the Boulder City Council. Thanks very much, Pam. Thank you. And I guess everyone look for the email um, asking for your signature. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Very good. Okay, Debbie, what's next? Our final public hearing this evening is the second reading of Ordinance 8439, the Utility Occupation Tax Amendments. Great, so for this item, uh, Steve Katnack, our Director of Climate Initiatives, will be able to present the item. Um, I'm actually presenting an update on uh, the partnership that we're forging with Excel um, I believe Tom or David is available for any questions that might be associated with the ordinance and the tax measure that uh, uh, this really represents. But uh, what I wanted to provide was an uh, update on the status of our partnership with Excel. You know, we are now a little over two weeks, three weeks and past our election. And we've been working diligently to put that together. So Emily, if we could please start the presentation. Very good. If we could uh, please go to the next slide. So we've really been approaching this on two different areas of focus. One being the closeout of the municipalization effort. And what we have been in the process of doing is beginning to organize and archive the municipalization, our documents, our analysis, all of the designs that we have done uh, for separation of the two utility systems and all of the financials that we've done. We are also in the process of ensuring that those archived records are connected to a roadmap, which would allow us to restart the municipalization effort should either council or the community direct us to do so. We're also in the process of closing out the financial obligations of the municip municipal effort. Um, with, this includes paying off a debt of a little over $1.4 million that we owe to the general fund that was borrowed pre-2017 uh, in order to carry the municipalization forward. We are anticipating that we should have those last bills uh, processed uh, by early next year and should be able to completely close out the municipalization effort. In the memo packet, there was a table, but unfortunately it's already very dated uh, because we have paid some other significant bills uh, that shows that from the savings associated or the unspent money from the municipalization effort, we should be able to close out the project without tapping into the repurposed funds. Now, when we finally close this out, that we may have to extend into the repurposed UOT uh, to complete the payment to the general fund, but it's gonna be very close, we estimate. Emily, if we could please move forward. The other area that we're focusing on is standing up the partnership with Excel Energy. Um, as you all recall, we designated a governance structure to ensure that the partnership was successful. Uh, the portion we are currently working on now is uh, seating the executive team. This is a team that is designated to really provide the oversight and is responsible for ensuring the success of the partnership. Uh, the executive team will be made up of uh, the city manager and the Colorado president of Excel Energy and other designated staff as um, each selects. 
We're also seating the project oversight team. And the project oversight team is the team that will actually be organizing the projects and the work uh, associated with the partnership. Uh, this is uh, gonna be a uh, team that represents multiple departments of the city and has the ability and authority to assign subject matter experts to the uh, different projects that are ongoing. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to that, there is an advisory panel that we've designated that is between, I believe, five and 15 community members that will advise the project oversight team on the selection of projects and the um, ensure that we are hearing what the community desires uh, from the partnership. We're currently in the process of working with Excel to define the process for the selection of that advisory panel. Next slide, please. As an example of some of the projects that we're beginning to organize around is the city had several ongoing initiatives that it is appropriate to work with Excel on. Uh, the first one of those is a solar policy revision uh, that we are working with Excel and working with Senator Feinberg um, to move forward with some changes to uh, rules governing the deployment of solar. We also had un already undertaken a uh, analysis of the um, feasibility of uh, the Alpine Balsam project, looking at alternative energy sources, electrification, how, how can we best utilize the redevelopment of a brownfield site to take full advantage of opportunity as we're rebuilding the campus there. We also, over the course of a number of years, have been exploring different street lighting solutions. And what the partnership is enabling us to do there is to get additional data about the existing street lights in the city that Excel owns. And we're currently working with them to explore different alternatives to um, upgrading that street lighting system. Next slide, please. The newer projects that were agreed upon in the settlement and the partnership agreement that we see as high priority items because they're very long term. These are elements that will take place year after year is uh, developing how we will work together with Excel on their distribution system planning. This is really um, allowing us the opportunity to take place in how the electric system in Boulder will be operated, um, what work will be done on it, and what um, really grid modernization could take place on it. So this is a real opportunity for us to have some say so on the activities taking place in Boulder. We also have the underground to or overhead to underground conversion funding that is both made up from uh, when we went out of franchise a decade ago, plus the new money. So over the course of the next five years, uh, there will be about $16.5 million available for overhead to underground conversion. We're in the process of <clears throat> re-establishing the guidelines and the criteria that will be used to select those undergrounding projects. Um, the um, 10 years ago, they were going by a set of uh, criteria that they established, I believe, in 1994. So we would like to modernize that and ensure that we have the flexibility to achieve the goals that we're trying to achieve in Boulder today. The part of the agreement uh, we also need to move quickly on is the data sharing uh, portion of that. And this is both to provide us with better data so that we can design our programs and our projects to better serve the community, but also to ensure we have up-to-date information should the municipalization um, initiative take move forward again. Uh, next slide, please. 
So, and along with that, we're also working on a communications plan. Um, we have an opportunity and we will have uh, significant milestones uh, with Excel. And so we want to ensure that we have a methodology worked out in a process for how we will work together to communicate about the things we do together. Uh, next steps for the partnership are the uh, integration of all these project teams, but also we plan to bring to council or to get to council a timeline for the selection of the advisory committee uh, as we work it out with Excel. And hopefully we'll have that to you by the end of December. Uh, in January, we want to begin the regular executive team and project oversight team and regular team meetings for the projects. In March, I think it's March 3rd or 4th for that meeting, we plan to come forward with a budget for the partnership uh, along with the closeout of the municipalization project. And then in addition to that, we'll be bringing forward as a climate initiative staff uh, in May, uh, new goals and targets uh, for the community and our community engagement process. So that's a very quick, very brief update with a lot of in-depth details behind that, but uh, next slide, please. So, Thank you all very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I also have Jonathan Cohen with me and Carol Elam, if there are any questions. Great. Thanks very much, Steve. That was super helpful. I, I do just want to, I'll ask you, I think I know the answer, but I'll just double check. For the governance team, the oversight team, which includes the city manager and the CEO of Piesco, um, there's regular meetings for that. Is that correct? That's correct. Those uh, will be quarterly um, at a minimum for the first two years. And then I believe it goes to once every six months, if appropriate, after two years. Okay, very good. Thanks very much. Aaron, I see you have a question. Sorry, dealing with uh, dog problems there for a moment. Um, <laughs> So yes, yeah, Steve, that, that was uh, really helpful and getting a sense of those timelines is very instructive, very useful. I know there's a lot of community interest in the next steps. Is that, can we get that up on, on the website somewhere that we could direct to people so that there, there's some a way that people could look at that information? Absolutely, we will uh, make sure it's up on our page uh, right away. Great, yes, yeah, so if you wouldn't mind sending council an email when that's up so that we can uh, point people to that, that would be super helpful. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Adam? Thanks, Sam, and thank you, Steve. Um, I think an important part of a debrief of all this might be, you know, the, the franchise agreement passed. There's no question about that, so I don't want to relitigate that at all, but there were some questions about the legality of forming the franchise agreement and that all the processes were followed correctly. Um, if this has to come up again in the future, you know, if Excel fails that they're meeting their goals and we go through this all over again. I think it's important that we have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed um, it, when we're looking back at all this. So making sure we answer those questions, I think is pretty important um, as part of that debrief uh, that you know we did the process exactly correctly as far as uh, the charter goes. So I'm preparing a memo that answers all of those questions uh, it's it's a little it's a lot more detailed than I was hoping. I'm hoping to get that out within the next week or so, and it will not be a confidential memo. It'll be avail available to the public. Okay, thank you, Tom. Great. I see no other hands up, so we'll turn it back to staff. I apologize. So, Tom. Uh, just to make sure, Tom, did you have um, any additional comment on the tax provisions and the ordinance? No, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. It just implements the uh, ballot measure of proving the extension and repurposing of the UOT. There is a few details in there. I'm happy to address them if council has any questions. Okay, very good. Hang on, I'm pulling up the 
I don't see any questions. Um, I know that Mary asked one question about carbon sequestration that I thought was interesting. Uh, Mary asked if carbon sequestration expenses could be covered by these funds. And Tom answered that yes, uh, in the past carbon sequestration projects have been considered as part of clean energy plans. I, I'm not quite sure that that sounds completely right. It, in the sense that um, what we're really after here is not energy projects precisely, but it's reducing um, carbon emissions as, and part of that is taking carbon dioxide out of the air. So I don't know if, Mary, you had any follow-ups on that. Uh, I found Tom's answers sufficient, um, but certainly something we should talk about in the future. Um, I was satisfied with the answer. Okay. And I've seen, Tom, go ahead. I perhaps wasn't clear. The, the ballot measure said that projects that are consistent, that are part of the city's clean energy plan. And I checked back and looked at our clean energy plan and we have funded carbon sequestration projects in, as part of the clean energy plan in the past. Very good. That's just a terminology thing that I'll pursue internally later. Okay, super. I guess we're ready for a motion. Any of you want, want to make a motion? Sam, did we um, have anyone for the public hearing? Oh, thank you. That's great. Great point. Um, I, yes, we do. And that's my mistake. Thanks very much. Okay, turning now to the public hearing. I have public hearing three lists up here. Trying to bring it up. There we go. We have three people signed up for the public hearing. Lynn Siegel, Paul Coleman, and Leslie Glustrom. So when you're ready, Sarah, I think we can start with Lynn. Lynn Siegel, I don't support the resetting of the 2D. Um, I voted for it long ago and it was for municipalization. Done. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Uh, next we have Paul Coleman and then Leslie Glustrom. Paul? First, uh, Paul Coleman, Paul, oh, Paul, we can't having, hear you. Yeah, we're having trouble hearing you. <laughs> Is this better? That's yes. better. Okay, I got to get real close to my laptop here. Uh, hello again, council members. I'm Paul Coleman, South Boulder. Um, the $2 million a year UOT won't go far in stopping global warming. We'll just be nibbling around the edges of the problem. With the UOT and cap taxes, our sole funding sources will be hard pressed to come even close to meeting our climate goals. We must not rely on the partnership with Excel to deliver our energy goals. Consider the partnership as just one more tool in the toolbox. I recommend Boulder partner with the city of Denver in pursuing system-wide emissions reductions. Denver has similar emissions and renewable energy goals to Boulder. And Boulder is now in a similar situation as Denver in terms of being highly dependent on Excel to provide low emission electricity. And they've had a two year head start on their partnership with Excel. Let's leverage what Denver is doing. Uh, go to the PUC shoulder to shoulder, go to the legislature arm in arm, strengthen numbers. Uh, not that Boulder would do exactly what Denver does, but it couldn't hurt to check in with them and see what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Next we have Leslie Glustrom. Good evening, uh, Mayor Weaver and council members. Thank you so much as always for all of your hard work on so many issues. Uh, my name is Leslie Glustrom. I live in Boulder. A few comments. I wanna thank Councilman Swetlick for trying to make sure we get clear about the charter provisions and the franchise. It was all done very quickly this summer and we, want to, we do wanna make sure those I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. So thank you very much. Um, I sent an email to council this afternoon on this uh, utility occupation tax repurposing. There were four provisions in the ballot language that I believe the voters, I mean, that these were the provisions that really helped the voters, I think, decide to vote in nice numbers 
for this ballot measure, providing energy related assistance to disadvantaged members of the community, proving system reliability and modernizing the system, uh, the partnership agreement with Excel and increased access to energy efficiency and renewable energy solutions. So I would ask that the council put that language that was in ballot measure 2D into this ordinance. So it gets carried forward um, not many people are going to do what I did, which is to find the ballot measure and all, and then compare it to this ordinance. So I would ask that you you put that language back in. And then finally, on the city manager position, uh, it's kind of stunning that somehow the consultant didn't put in meeting our climate goals. And while I think Councilman Brockett will advocate for addressing that, I, I don't think we should be paying a consultant a lot of money to make a fancy brochure with cute pictures in it when they've missed one of our most important community objectives. So I would ask that the council take a hard look at that, that you ask some hard questions, you ask staff to ask some hard questions of the consultant. If, I mean, I don't know how this works, but I would take away some of the pay for the consultant because this is a massive oversight. So I appreciate getting it fixed, but I think there's a more deeper underlying problem and we wanna make sure the consultant is carrying that priority forward. Um, you know, I'm in favor of hiring internally because people get what we do in Boulder if you hire internally, but that may not be possible. But so I appreciate the council's attention. Thank you for all of this. As I always really appreciate everything y'all are doing. Thank you, Leslie. <clears throat> and with that, we will close the public hearing, bring it back to council for discussion or a motion. Rachel. Yeah, I just wondered, um, and I did read Tom's e email response earlier, um, but does it cost us to put the exact language um, that Leslie's referring to that was on the ballot into this, um, into what we're voting on tonight? Like, why not include it? What does it cost us? That's you'd have question to, go, to Tom. You have to go to a third reading. Um, it's, it's also really unnecessary. I can't tell you how many times we go back to the ballot measure. When anybody, anybody asks us about what can a measure, what can money be used for, we always go back to the ballot measure language. It's stronger. Putting it in the code doesn't make it any stronger. It's, it's to some extent it weakens it. The strongest thing is having it in the ballot measure. So, um, I mean, you can do it. It doesn't add anything. There is some risk that it, there'd be some confusion um, because if we got something wrong, but that's not likely. Uh, I just don't see any benefit for doing it because we always go back to the ballot language. I, if you ask me, how do we spend this? How can we spend the sugar sweetened beverage tax? I would go to the ballot language, not to the code. So uh, it, it doesn't cost anything except a third reading. Okay, thanks, um, and and I appreciate that. I guess if it if it um, makes the community feel more secure that um, the language is in there and and. Um, the institutional knowledge is therefore codified. Um, I, I suppose I, I'm comfortable going to a third reading on it. That's all. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Aaron? Um, I could make a motion if that's... Oh, okay, um, that would be great. I would ask, I'll just put in two cents before you make the motion. If we want to include language like Leslie and Rachel referenced, I would just want it to say including but not limited to because I think there could be other things that were that are worthy, um, which may lie outside of those buckets. So um, anyway, just for you to think about Aaron as you make your motion. Sure. Well, tell me if we were going to um, insert that language, where exactly would you recommend putting that? I would guess in the in the recitals at the beginning of the of the uh, ordinance. There, let me. I'm pulling it up now, Aaron. Um, so, legislative purpose, findings, and intent, uh, or findings, I guess. So I would add, actually, I would add under uh, section 3-13-1 on page 11 of the packet, uh, actually now going on to page 12, a new D that says purpose. Uh, 
and then quote the language from the ballot measure. Okay, so not you wouldn't include an intent in C, you would do a new D purpose? Yeah. Okay, well, I, I mean, I hear you tell me about the, that it's not necessary, um, but I think it, it, to Rachel's point, I don't think it, it hurts to, to clarify it I, as long as we go with um, Sam's um, included but not limited, included but not limited to. Uh, so, as I recall, the ballot language says that. Okay, perfect. That would, that would certainly take care of it. So then I'll, I'll go ahead and make a motion to move um, that we approve ordinance um, 8439 uh, while adding a, um, an item 3-13-1-D purpose that includes the language from the ballot measure for the purposes that the tax might be used for. So Aaron, I apologize. We're doing this on the fly. I noticed that A says purpose. So uh, we probably need to find a different word, perhaps voters intent or vo vo ballot language or something. Uh, usage of funds. Usage of funds. That's fine. That work. Okay. So, so D, uh, the new item D usage of funds that includes the language from the ballot measure on, on the usage of the funds. Excellent. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Mary, you raising your hand? We can't hear you. Sorry. Um, I have a question. Is there, by including this language, is there, could we find ourselves in a place where we would regret doing that, especially since we're doing it on the fly? I have many regrets, Mary, but I, I don't know that we'll regret this. I, th I think with the language that Sam and Aaron have come up with, it should be fine. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Still looking for a second. Sure, second. Okay. Mark second. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, is there any discussion? Seeing none. Um, we'll take a vote. Does anyone object to passing this ordinance? Seeing none, it passes unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you, Steve and Tom. And I think we're on to the next item, Debbie. Next item is matters from the city manager, which is the police strategic action plan and crime update. Yeah, the one matter for uh, uh, items under the city manager. Um, we have Chief Harold here to present this item along with her team. Good evening, Council. Thank you so much for having me back uh, tonight. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Um, tonight, I do have a co-presenter, and that is Beth Christensen. She is our new strategic and data, data policy advisor. Um, Beth's role. Um, since she was hired is really um, to integrate our technology platforms and also bring us up to speed and understanding our data, which you know is a main priority for me. And so um, I'm very happy she's with us tonight. Uh, next slide, please. So there you go. Perfect, now we're seeing it, Chief. Okay. Great, great, thanks. So um, tonight we will be going over a high level crime overview. We'll be looking at crime views in different time frames. We will also be looking at spatial analysis of the last year of crime, which is very important. Um, and then we're gonna be focusing in on national regional trends. We'll take a hard look at what's going on in Boulder this year. We'll be focusing in on bike theft, which is proving um, very problematic. We'll touch upon our domestic violence strategy that we talked about last time I was with you. And then we'll briefly go over what's next um, for the next quarter. Next slide, please. So I would be very remiss if um, we didn't talk about some major disruptions in policing, not only in Boulder, but across the state and across the country. And I would just like to um, thank the police officers of Boulder who continue to come to work and do a phenomenal job on a daily basis. We have faced um, some real challenges in 2020. Um, jail space 
continues to uh, be very problematic um, in Boulder. And this, again, isn't unique to Boulder. It's uh, occurring across the country. But as COVID worsens, the jail restrictions worsen. And it's unprecedented in 2020 that we are actually citing um, felony offenders for both burglaries, motor vehicle thefts, um, in really large numbers. And I do believe we are over 300 um, for felony offenders this year. In addition, um, we were receiving intelligence of possible uh, election disruption and tremendous amount of resources had to go into planning for possible election disruption um, in Boulder and cities close to Boulder. Obviously, uh, COVID has proven to be very um, resource driven. So staffing and resources have been uh, given throughout the city for this, um, including a couple clusters um, from our traffic unit and other um, officers within the Boulder Police Department that's impacted staffing negatively. The wildfires um, took a tremendous amount of resources away from the police department. Um, and I'm proud of the work that the fire and the police did in that arena. And then lastly, we cannot forget that the murder of George Floyd continues to provide, um, prove to be very disrupting in policing. And we are working very hard on police legitimacy and building communities of trust um, moving forward. Next slide, please. So I don't wanna go over everything. I just wanna uh, refocus back in on Boulder Police Department's commitment to police reform and our strategic plan update. Remember that these categories fell into six uh, categories of accountability, data, training, recruiting and hiring, use of force and crime strategy. So um, you can see everything that we accomplished in uh, quarter three. But in quarter four, I'm just gonna highlight a few of the things that I think are important. One is that our inspections commander um, continues to do daily, weekly, and monthly inspections. And the one that really stands out this quarter is our emergency prepar uh, preparedness policy and inspection, which proved pivotal um, because of the possible disruptions in the election. And so all of that was audited and came back really solid. So I'm proud of the work there. Um, Beth is gonna be talking a little bit about the crime reduction meetings with detectives, the crime pattern bulletins that she is putting out to all reliefs. And she'll talk a little bit about the relaunching of our open data and crime location information for the community. I'm also very proud of the work, our new training uh, section sergeant, he has concluded um, blocks of training in the critical decision-making model and the ICAT for all of the officers. Um, recruiting and hiring will continue into um, the, the beginning of 2021, but I'm proud to announce that the city hired a new uh, public safety information officer who really hit the ground running, and I thank Sarah Hunley for her help in that. Um, her name is Dion War, and she has just been doing really good community work uh, for the police department. Um, because I have a strong emphasis in professional standards investigation, I have added and selected a new sergeant to assist our professional standards to investigate citizens' complaints and use of force. Um, I think that this is one of the biggest priorities that I have moving forward. And so that was very important to, for, for me and uh, the professional standards work. Um, I have been engaging in as many community meetings as possible in this COVID environment. And I am beginning police town hall meetings, which I've had one thus far, and they will continue into 2021. And we'll talk a bit, little bit about that at the end of the presentation. Um, the only thing I really wanna alert you to, to the next um, quarter is that we will be conducting a very robust workload analysis that Beth has started. And by the end of the first quarter, we should have a really good idea of the work being done by the police department and staffing concerns. Next slide. So briefly, let's take a look at local and national trends. Um, next slide. I've talked about the Police Executive Research Forum and they're one of my favorite research organizations because they tend to be the most innovative and progressive. And they really did something unique here that was the first time I've seen this is that they combined, combined national trends of small, medium and large police departments nationally on violence. And as you can tell, 
Um, not only this, but news articles from across the country, violent crime is really skyrocketing. And there's probably several reasons for that. But um, when we look at Boulder, some of these trends uh, are consistent with Boulder. Um, sexual assaults and robberies are down though nationally. Property crime under the hand nationally um, is interesting because we do not have a full year. We are relying on FBI uh, property crime for national trends right now. I would expect that by the end of December, when the FBI releases its year end date trends, that we will start to see property crime on a national level rise as well. Next slide, please. So Beth did a really good job. Um, she contacted agencies from across Boulder County to understand what they were experiencing. So um, these are uh, agencies uh, adjacent to us in Boulder County as well. And it's, it's pretty interesting when you look at it. Assaults are up compared to other violent crimes. Um, and this runs true in Boulder. Motor vehicle thefts and theft from autos are up in Boulder and across the county. Burglaries are up in Boulder, but mixed results elsewhere. Domestic violence calls are up and police agencies are reporting victim services calls are up as well across the county. Sexual assault reports are down. However, calls to crisis centers are up. Child abuse reporting, DUIs, and drug offenses down across all cities. Um, so that's all very interesting information from a local perspective. Next slide. And so I am gonna turn it over to Beth Christensen, who's gonna give you a very detailed um, review of Boulder's crime. And Beth, with that, you're on. Awesome, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Council, for allowing me to update you today on where crime stands in Boulder. Um, I've really been spending these first four months trying to understand um, our systems, our data, our policies, our procedures so that we can better interpret the data out of our different systems. So what I'm gonna do in this crime review section is I'm gonna cover a bit of our preliminary workload analysis, very high level, um, discuss the different serious crime types that are out there, where we stand over a five-year average, and then we'll break down each of those different crime types specifically um, and look at some of the active projects that we're working on. So next slide, please. Okay, so we look at calls for service when we do a workload analysis. And when we're doing a workload analysis, we're trying to understand where officers are going, how often they're going, when they're going, um, all the specific details. And the goal is that we will be able to provide a better resource allocation strategy for the department. So what we do know is that year over year, we have about 80,000 calls for service to our 911 center. And over months, uh, we typically have a summer spike um, due to the number of people that are out and about and engaging within the community. Next slide, please. When we break down these calls for service, we look at different problem natures. A problem nature is a code a dispatcher will give based on the information a, call, uh, a caller provides them. And on the right, you'll see the top 10 calls for service types for BPD. What you will notice is that 14% of our call types are categorized as a welfare check or a medical call. So right now we're actively working with the fire, with the fire department to determine proper response for these types of calls. Preliminarily, our research shows that our department is engaging in about 75% reactive activity, meaning that they are responding to the radio based on calls for service 75% of the time. This leaves very little room for discretionary time where officers may engage in proactive policing. Proactive policing may include directed patrols into hotspot locations or engaging with the community on other crime prevention techniques. Best practice based on what we are trying to achieve here in the Boulder Police Department is to reach 55 to 60% reactive. That will increase the amount of time that officers have available to engage in proactive policing and participate in other administrative tasks. Next, next slide. So let's look at crime data. So when we break down crime data, we can look at it in terms of serious crimes for violent and property crime, sometimes referred to as part one crime. Violent crime will include homicides, forcible sex offenses, such as rapes, robberies, and aggravated assaults. I do wanna define aggravated assaults because this is where there is an intent to cause serious injury or harm to a person compared to a simple assault. We can also look at property crime. Property crimes include burglaries, theft from auto, motor vehicle theft, or theft or other larceny. Other larcenies may include purse snatching, pocket picking, and shoplifting. 
The other two items I do want to focus today, which sometimes fall under several of these different serious crime categories, are stolen bicycles and domestic violence. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's look at crime year over year. This chart shows the crimes between January 1st, November 19th, uh, between 2015 and 2020. So this allows us to compare the 2020 numbers to the five-year average to better understand where we are this year compared to previous years. And as the chief mentioned, and we all know with COVID, it's really an unprecedented crazy year. You will note that our crime is up across almost every category. However, keep in mind that these numbers are low. So looking at the percentage alone can be a little bit misleading. And that's why it's really important to break these down on an individual crime level and look at the trend over an extended period of time. So next slide, please. So I'll start with violent crime. Um, so before I dive into the data, you're gonna see a lot of these types of maps throughout the presentation. Um, these maps show the cluster of crime based on a two block radius. So if it's within a two block radius, we're considering it a cluster. So that is where you will see the more, most dense locations between January 1st and November 19th, 2020. So research after research shows that crime clusters and is not random and our analysis shows just that. Across, problem, across crime types here in Boulder. Violent crime is highly concentrated in the city of Boulder, as you can see on the map. We've identified five major hotspots concentrated within the 25 square miles of Boulder. For each of the specific crime types, we will also look at the victim-offender relationship. So the victim-offender relationship is based on federal standards, and we can categorize those into um, known relationships, stranger, and unknown. So known and stranger are pretty clear, but unknown is where um, the victim may not know specifically who the offender is or may not want to share that information. So officers code based on what the victim shares with them. So here we can see that for violent crime, we have a 38% have a known relationship. However, we do suspect that this number is greater based on investigations. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. So let's take a quick peek at homicides. So this year, Boulder did have two homicides. Both incidences had immediate arrest by officers. For the homicide at Circle K, the prosecutor has declined to pursue the charges further. The homicide at Sinton Park is still under investigations, but here what we can say. We know that both the victim and offender were experiencing homelessness at the time. We do know that the victim and offender had a relationship. However, we are not sure of the full extent of that relationship at this time. Next slide, please. So aggravated assault. So again, before I jump into this, you're gonna see a lot of charts like this. So I wanna kind of set the stage. So that yellow line on the chart, that is gonna be our five year average for this specific crime type we're gonna look at our normal range, which is plus or minus two standard deviations. So when our 2020 line, that dark blue line, falls within that gray area, we're in the normal range. When it falls outside that range, we are seeing a significant increase or decrease. So for aggravated assaults, we know that this year we are up 2% compared to the five-year average. And this year we've seen three periods where we've extended outside the normal range, right? So we're experiencing a statistically significant increase. So these, um, these scenarios occurred in early January where we fell below that normal range. We had a spike in late May, early June. And we also had a recent spike between late October and early November. So where is this all occurring? Next slide, please. You. Aggravated assaults are clustered in the city of Boulder. The largest hotspots are shown on the screen here. So we've got downtown Boulder, University Hill, 30th between uh, Pearl and Belmont, typo on my part, Foothills Hospital. So the weapons that are involved in these aggravated assaults include personal weapons, which is hands and feet. So that makes up about 35% of the aggravated assaults. Um, knife or cutting device makes up for about 28% of the weapons involved, and the various firearms make up about 11%, and the, and the remainder are other various weapons, such as a, a blunt object. The victim-offender relationship highlights that 36% of the victims know the offender. However, it's really important to keep in mind that under Colorado law, if an officer is spit at, bitten, um, or is prevented from in any way 
of performing a lawful duty, the offender receives an aggravated assault charge. And 22% of our aggravated assaults involve a law enforcement officer as a victim. Furthermore, out of these aggravated assaults, 44% of our aggravated assaults involve domestic violence. I wanna specifically call out the Foothills Hospital hotspot because out of the eight incidences that are here, uh, five of these occurred on premise, which was a staff and patient um, conflict where the rest were offsite where we do not have a known location. Next slide, please. So robberies. Robberies in the city of Boulder have increased significantly this year with several spikes above our normal range. This year, we are up 47% compared to the five-year average. However, these numbers are relatively small, so I want to keep it in perspective. So if we look at the scale on the left, we can see that the greatest number of robberies on a 28-day rolling window is 10. So let's take a look at where these are occurring. Next slide, please. Forgot the next slide part. Thank you. So again, violent crime, like all crime, is highly concentrated. Here on the map, we've identified four clusters at Valmont and 30th, downtown Boulder in the civic, civic area uh, with the small kind of attached cluster to the Southwest, 28th and Pearl, and then again at Baseline and 36. What weapons are involved here? So we have 46% personal weapons. It's about 12% for knife and cutting device and 17% include firearms and the remainder are various other weapons. Our victim offender relationship shows that only 25% have a known victim offender relationship. However, 39% of the unknown relationship we understand to be more known based on the investigations and our understanding of crime science. We know that there's more of a relationship there that the victim may not be alluding to. Next slide, please. Thank you. So forcible sex offenses, remember these include things such as rape. And forcible sex offenses are down 47% compared to the five-year average. And we do suspect that this is down due to the reduction in bar activity and university parties compared to previous years, and that is primarily due to COVID. Next slide, please. Our sex offenses are even highly concentrated in the city of Boulder. Crime is not random. I've highlighted three major hotspots, University Hill, the Southeast University area, and then the police department. So while our police department is not a hotspot, there is actually no sex offense that has occurred here. It does illustrate that there are incidences where we do not know the exact location. So furthermore, three out of the, out of the five reports that came to the police station, they are cold reports, meaning that they um, are passed uh, in this instance, all three of them were over a year since they occurred. It's not uncommon that most of our victim offender relationships for forcible um, sex offenses are known. This is typically a known relationship between two individuals. Next slide, please. Okay, so now that we wrapped, wrapped up violent crime, let's take a look at the property crime. So while more widely distributed compared to violent crime, property crime is still highly concentrated at places. And this is consistent with our violent crime and trends we see across the country. Particularly in Boulder, we can see quickly that crime is concentrated around high traffic areas, including downtown Boulder, uh, the Pearl, Pearl um, I'm sorry, the, the 29th Street Mall, uh, anything around Arapahoe and 28th. Most of these are all shopping and retail districts. But again, property crime is highly preventable and we'll break down what we can do for each of these crime types to help prevent that crime. So next slide, please. Burglaries. So the city of Boulder has seen a 27% increase this year compared to the five-year average. You can see on the chart where we have the, the nationwide COVID shutdown, right? So several businesses have to close their doors for weeks. Right, so this creates an opportunity for burglarization. It makes the business vulnerable. Okay, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Lost my spot. Okay, so where are these occurring? We've identified three major hotspots between um, downtown Boulder, uh, the University Hill area, and again, a storage unit shopping area that's along Arapahoe on the east side of town. 29% of our burglaries are businesses. Several of these businesses, again, were closed during the early stages of the pandemic and some of them have remained closed. 
recently, we have had a series of bike shop burglaries. You've probably seen some of that in our press releases from the Boulder Police Department. We're really positive right now because our investigative leads uh, appear promising at this time. So hopefully more in the near future. The major thing I wanna hit on here though is that 27% of our victims report that they left a house unlocked, unattended or a garage open. So a simple crime prevention measure that we can all do is lock our doors and keep your garage shut. Next slide, please. This year uh, for motor vehicle thefts, and this is the actual taking of a vehicle, um, we have seen a 36% uh, increase compared to the five-year average. And we've seen a pretty significant increase specifically since August. And we do suspect that some of that is due to the college students returning. Next slide, please. This crime is more widely distributed around the city, but still with high concentrations in specific locations. One of those hot spots is up at Calmia, and I hope I'm saying that right, and 36, where we had five uh, vehicles stolen, but four of those were in early January. We've also had a series of motor vehicle thefts, again, kind of along the shopping district area on the east side of campus. Um, and then we've also had a hot spot at University Hill. What I want to highlight here is that in University Hill, nine of the motor vehicle thefts that occurred here were along Pleasant Street alone, with four of them occurring in September, October. And most of these were due to cars being unlocked along the street. 15% of our victims report leaving their car unlocked or garage open. However, we do suspect that this number is higher based on our understanding of how the cars were stolen. So what are the challenges here when it comes to motor vehicle thefts in 2020? So in 2020, this is the first year that we have had to write a felony seven summons for someone who has stolen a vehicle. Only 50% of our offenders this year have gone to jail. In previous years, it has been 100%. This is back to the chief's point that the jails being closed or minimum um, or less people being in the jail is really impacting our crime because yes, we do have repeat offenders for motor vehicle thefts. Next slide, please. So let's look at theft from autos. Theft from autos or vehicle trespassing is experiencing a 37% increase compared to the five year average. And I just wanna highlight theft from auto is the actual taking of something physically from a vehicle, but not the vehicle itself. So since the shutdown, the city of Boulder, uh, of the city of Boulder in mid-March, our theft from autos have stayed consistently up above the normal range. This is 100% a crime of opportunity. And I know I keep saying that, but it's so important to highlight. Let's go to the next slide. It's so important because 47% of our victims report that their doors were left unlocked or unattended with things uh, visible within the car. These crimes are concentrated around shopping districts and parking lots where vehicles are left unattended for extended period of, periods of time. At Pearl and Junction, we have a hotel, we have several hotels in that area with parking along the streets and an RT, RTD station where vehicles are left unattended for extended periods of time. University Hill, plenty of students uh, leaving their cars unlocked after parties, et cetera. Southeast campus, lots of housing down there for students where vehicles are left unattended. The park and ride, extended period of time where someone is not by their vehicle. The one that struck me a little bit uniquely was Mohawk Drive, where we had 10 offenses within two block ranges within a short period of time. But the biggest thing here is crime prevention. You can, we can prevent this. Keep valuables out of your car and lock your car. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at thefts or other larceny. So again, the, these crimes are, you know, pocket picking, purse snatching and shoplifting. So this is the only property crime that is experiencing a decrease in 2020 compared to the five year average at 10%. So we do suspect that this is largely due to the decrease in the crowds and disorder, minimizing the opportunity for this type of theft. Next slide, please. Again, you're seeing the same types of hot spots pop up. Crime is highly concentrated in our community and these thefts are occurring in downtown Boulder um, between Arapahoe and, and Pearl along 28th where our shopping districts are. 
Um, a lot of the major retailers in their city are around, are around these intersections, including places like Home, Home Depot, which is one of our um, repeat addresses of, of other larcenies. The crime prevention method here is, is leave your valuables off your porches. We actually did an environmental assessment with our community officer where we walked around some apartments where things were just left on the porch. And that does count as another larceny. Or when you're out and about, make sure you know where your valuables are with you at all times. But there's certainly other crime prevention methods that we plan on doing here in the near future. So next slide, please. So let's look at our focus projects. Um, so now that we've covered our serious crime categories, remember back to kind of the serious, the serious crime chart where we talk about our locally focused projects. Um, so I'm going to dive into some specific projects that BPD is actively working on right now. Um, so let's jump to the next slide, please. Okay, so domestic violence. I know the chief discussed um, at the last meeting she was at that domestic violence is trending upwards. And it absolutely is. And this is extremely concerning because as we go into the winter, as we go into the next stage of this pandemic, more people are gonna be stuck inside with less opportunity to seek assistance. Next slide, please. So what are we doing about it? Well, right now our victims advocate supervisor is training officers on how to use a lethality assessment. So what is a lethality assessment? Well, a lethality assessment is a way to identify the vulnerability of a victim to serious physical danger and assist the victim in understanding their risk. And hopefully it opens up a line of communication between the officer and the victim themselves. Next slide, please. Stolen bicycles. I know that this one is a hot topic right now and it is a chronic problem within the city of Boulder. So as of November 22nd, we had 995 reported stolen bicycles this year with a total value of $1.83 million. This blows me away. The average price of a bicycle being stolen is 1.8 thousand. It should be noted though that the value of the bike is self-reported by the victim. So we've identified uh, recent hotspot locations down to the street segment. So when we look at crime down to the street segment, and a street segment again is like a one block um, um, from an intersection to an intersection. And when we look at that crime street segment scale, we begin to focus in on better crime prevention techniques that are more actionable than say a hotspot. It's easier to tell an officer, hey, go to the 100 block of Main Street versus go to this hotspot that covers maybe 10 square blocks. So as you see on the map, we've highlighted two of the major um, hotspot segments within the city of Boulder. And one is along the Southeast campus at 28th and Aurora, and then over at Eisenhower in Arapahoe, where there are several apartment buildings um, and to the point earlier that there are several bikes that are left out on porches um, and taken quite swiftly and easily. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, please. So what are we doing about it? Um, so now that we've identified the hotspot locations and we're looking at a street segment level, I've been able to work with officers, um, our community service officer, our detectives, and really appreciate all their help and wanna give them a shout out. Um, and we were able to come up with a crime bulletin. And so a crime bulletin is a tool that we can give our line officers to know what is going on um, as a whole throughout the city. So what we do is we provide them intelligence, when and where is this occurring, um, specific notes from our detectives on maybe an, an active case. Um, and then what we do is we come up with specific proactive policing techniques. And so we give them tasks that we want them to complete um, to try to help minimize that crime. So we let them know these specific hot street segments, what time, what day of week, when they should go to these areas and engage with the community. And some of that is just, hey, we want to hand out bicycle registration stickers for a new bicycle registration program, which I will talk about here in a minute. We also want to work with um, environmental assessments. Our community service officer actually went out and performed some environmental assessments with bike shops before the last bike shop burglary. Um, and unfortunately, that last one happened. But again, we're, we're really optimistic about some leads that we currently have. Um, but we're working on being more proactive, using data to kind of guide where we are putting officers and what type of strategy we can implement. Uh, so next slide, please. 
So the one thing I want to encourage everybody to do in the community is register your bike. It's so simple, especially with our new bike index program. So we've partnered with bike index where you can register your bike. So once you register, you can upload a picture, serial number, um, other specific contact information. And if your bike would ever get stolen and show up in a different jurisdiction, they can find you and get your back bike back to you. So it's a really great program. We're partnering with local bike shops. We um, have the registration stickers coming in. I don't think they're in yet, but soon we will have officers handing those out. So I encourage you go to bikeindex.org and register your bike today. Uh, next slide, please. So the other part of this that we are engaging with our new legal advisor um, who came on board recently is to provide guidance on on how to stop persons that we suspect have a stolen bicycle. And in doing this, we can provide the confidence to the officers and the legality of, of reasonable suspicion stops, right? So the more they become confident in that, um, the less issues that we may have um, on the back end. Uh, next slide, please. So being a data person, I am extremely excited about this endeavor and I cannot wait to launch it to the community. We have a forthcoming stolen bicycle story map and dashboard. So what this will be is kind of a summation of everything that you saw today, an interactive dashboard where we can look at time of day, day of week, where are the bikes being stolen, um, having information about those, um, the, uh, the specifics of the bikes. Um, and, and we're gonna partner again with our local bike shops to help promote this. So I can't wait to launch this. I'm very, very excited. Little bit more work to do, but hopefully you're gonna see that here in the coming weeks. So next slide, please. Okay, so what can you expect from me and the Boulder Police Department here in uh, the, the next couple quarters? So next slide, please. So but before I say all this, I really wanna give a shout out to IT. Um, they've been really supportive in trying to set up infrastructure for some of these um, data initiatives that we are working on into the IT staff here in the police department. They've been phenomenal and instrumental in me being able to get where I am today. Um, so what can you expect before the end of Q4? Um, we are going to relaunch that data connection to Cities Open Data Portal. Uh, that is my goal um, here in the next couple of weeks to finish that, have that reconnected so that everyone can know where crime is occurring, the specific location, the type of crime, and the date. The other thing you can expect from us is the Chief's Town Hall. That'll be starting um, officially on December 10th from 4 to 5, and it'll be something that we are doing regularly um, and getting some more press out on that. And so hopefully that will provide more engagement with the community um, coming up. So in Q1, so January, February, March, um, we're going to be completing our detailed workload analysis. We are also gonna be looking to kick off our records management system implementation. So this is very exciting. We are looking to get a new records management system which will help integrate all of our data and make it much more simply, uh, much more simple to analyze. We'll also be kicking off our program called CopDat. CopDat is a data uh, aggregation platform for our officers so that they have easily accessible interactive data at their fingertips to help with their policing. The last thing that we'll be doing in Q1 is launching our version one of our uh, Boulder Police Department data transparency website. So very excited about all of these, a lot of work ahead of us, but I, I am thrilled to be here. Um, and I open the floor up for questions. Thank you so much. Sam, you're muted. It has to happen once, right? So every day. Um, thank you, Chief. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Beth. And um, thanks to everybody who helped put this together from the IT department. What I was saying when I was unintelligible was we get lots of questions about this subject. So it would be great to have this, not only the data transparency piece that you're talking about, but just this presentation available for us to be able to point out to people would be really fantastic. So thanks again for the work and the presentation. I've got Adam and Aaron here. Adam. Thank you, Sam. I just had uh, a few questions. The first being, um, I've spent a lot of time downtown working there 
and I've seen a lot of aggra aggravated assault myself. I've filled out plenty of police reports. Um, I, I guess one of the questions I had for a long time now is what percentage of those more college centric crimes um, are, are sort of college related. So, you know, where, where do we lie um, above a, a town our size that doesn't have a major institution in it? You know, just so we can sort of get a good comparison. And I know you probably don't have that percentage right offhand, but that's, that's a really good piece of information I'd like to know. And I think the community would like to know um, so they can kind of get a perspective of what a college town looks like versus what a non-college town looks like. Yeah, that's a really great question, Adam. And, and, you know, definitely something we can look at in the future. So there is something called benchmark cities, um, which is where, you know, we can compare to other cities that have similar demographics, simple, um, similar kind of economic structure, and, and we can compare that data between our benchmark cities. So that might be something to take a look at, but um, yeah, don't have the numbers today. For sure. I, I just know I've seen a lot of our violent crime is two kids who get into it after drinking a lot. And that, you know, I think that should sort of be qualified to a degree when we're reporting that type of data, because that's a pretty specific college town thing. Um, my second question was, uh, you mentioned for motor vehicle thefts and thefts of, in motor vehicles, um, a little bit about street parking. Is that primarily a street parking issue? Um, so are you at more risk if you're parking on the street? And are there any specific solutions to that, you know, specificity of where you're parking? I think the answer is yes. Um, but ultimately, it always comes down to lock your car and leave your valuables out of your car. You know, one of the, the methods that we can go and do a public information campaign on is, is leave the junk in the trunk, right? And, and, and really, it's a crime of opportunity. So absolutely, the location matters. Um, I think that's I've also heard that street lighting can sometimes matter. So absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Maybe. Pushing Environmental well. factors absolutely impact this type of crime. So even some of the burglaries that we're seeing, and not just that from auto, um, are places where there's not a lot of light. Um, we've had um, homeowners where um, there's no light above the garage door, right? So it's the recommendation is, hey, put a light above your garage door, and this will help minimize uh, the, the opportunity for a crime to occur. And the last one I had was about the bike index and just bike thefts in general. Um, I know you're probably on top of this, but just a suggestion is I see most of this on next door when it comes to people self-reporting essentially. So um, just wanted to make sure that that is a major communication channel so people know how to register and sort Absolutely. of, yeah. Yeah, yep. and we're thrilled to have our new public information officer on board and giving her a shout out. I know she's on the call tonight. Um, she'll be able to help us uh, really get in touch with, with some of the community members. Awesome, thank you both. Adam? Yes. Your question about uh, locations is, is really good. And I will send you a link to one of the best studies in the country on about um, theft from auto and picking parking garages um, compared to street parking. And it really does come down to the environment and how uh, these parking garages are managed. So I'll send you a link and it's pretty interesting. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Adam. Next, we've got Aaron and Rachel and Mary. Aaron. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Chief Harold and, and Beth. And Beth, I, I'm, I'm a data guy myself. That's a lot of my day job, but that was very impressive. I really appreciated all that information and the statistics and the analysis. So really appreciate that and look, look forward to getting uh, even more of that kind of stuff going forward. So thanks so much for that. So one thing, and this is probably more a question for Chief Harold, you know, so the, the bike thefts is one of the things that we hear about the most, you know, of, of um, folks losing bikes and, and it's their primary form of transportation, the way they get to work, et cetera, or the bike shop owners who are being you know, subjected to this. And so clearly it's, it's a significant problem. I mean, it always is in this town, but it, it seems to be clearly more right now. And so th those were some great tips, Beth, about um, registering and some other ways that we can do prevention. But are there any trends that, or, or nexus, nexi, or whatever that word is, that we can kind of crack down on? Like, are there purchasers out there who are, you know, kind of 
encouraging some of this theft because they're creating a market for high-end bike thefts or chop shops or something like that? Like, are, are, is there anything we can do kind of on the solution side there, on the enforcement of the, of the major actors there? Aaron, that's a, that's a great question. And I can tell you, and we can, we can talk a little bit um, more about this, is that um, the intelligence, there's definitely... Um, offenders that are targeting high-end bikes and they are going all over the place. And I can tell you that we have regional investigations on this now. Um, and to be honest with you, it's, it's kind of alarming because there's um, trails from Boulder to Denver to other parts of the, the, the state and even down south um, that, you know, sophisticated um, offenders or are targeting not only high-end bikes, but bicycle shops themselves. And so all I can tell you um, in an open forum is that we know this is going on. We have investigations on the regional level and with our federal partners. Okay, that's good to hear. Uh, hopefully we'll get updates on that someday. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Aaron. Rachel? Yep, um, I will echo um, Aaron's compliment to Beth. That was a fantastic presentation. So thank you for all of that information. And um, my question is pretty similar to Aaron's really. It's, you know, I understand what we're doing with um, reducing the crimes of opportunity and like targeting those neighborhoods where the thefts are most likely occurring. But um, it seems like without getting at the root cause of the market, my guess would be that if those neighborhoods are, are shored up and bikes aren't being stolen there, they may be stolen from a different neighborhood instead. So I'm just a little bit concerned. How, how does that play out in Boulder in general? Because it is an ongoing problem and it's worse this year. And, and it seems like we're being pretty targeted for this type of theft right now. So it's like, I understand we should register our bikes, but if, if we don't get at the underlying issues and root causes of, of thefts in Boulder, is that is that enough of a solution, I guess, is the question. Um, Rachel, uh, really great question. And I mean, I guess we could talk about this for a long time, but I am a <laughs> big believer in um, the principles of displacement. Um, and so when research shows us is when you target harden, um, whether it be a hot product like bikes or you target harden a vehicle or you target harden a house or you target harden a, a street segment that Beth mentioned. Um, it's really rare that you have any form of displacement to another area. And so study after study after study shows that the more the police and the community understand the crime problem and they deal with it in partnership and, and, and do it effectively, the less likely the crime will displace because the environment has so much to do with crimes. And if you look at crime in Boulder, it is clustering in these areas for specific reasons. And the more we find out why that is from an environmental um, perspective, the less likely it is to, to go to another part of Boulder. So you can see this across the country when people focus in on shooting violence, homicides, it really is understanding the environments. And I can tell you that the more granular Beth gets in her analysis, the more we'll understand this and the less likely we will have displacement in Boulder. Good, good to hear. Um, and then I had asked previously about getting like monthly updates and I understand if we're gonna get a new kind of online data source, maybe we wouldn't need it coming to us because we could go to that, but just wanted to touch base on, I think this is really helpful and it, it can help to inform some of our decision-making. So wondering how frequently we can expect these awesome updates. Poor Beth will have to answer that. Um, <laughs> I, I know I've overpromised her and um, I, and I wanna be as transparent as I can with this data because it's so important because I can't do it alone. The police can't do it alone. This is mostly gonna be a community partnership. And so Rachel, I hear you loud and clear. And I think uh, Beth could probably give you a little bit better idea of how frequently we can get this information out. Yeah, I think, Rachel, I've been thinking about how to kind of disseminate this information and, and maybe not at council meetings we're getting in this, you know, level of detail, you know, every month or however often we want to do this. Um, but I'm thinking like a monthly quick report 
I think is something that's totally doable. However, I do think that data transparency site that we are hoping to launch in, um, in Q1 uh, with the help of the IT department, um, I think that's really gonna meet the overall needs um, of city council and, and, and really the community members. So I can 100% commit to like a monthly report where it's, you know, maybe a, even if it's just a chart and some maps um, like you saw tonight. That's awesome, thank you. Yeah. Great, and I'm, I might just <clears throat> add to that thought that we have a quarterly update from the municipal judge. And it might be interesting if we had a regular update from um, you, Chief. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily have to be about data, but maybe it would have um, data slides in the backup or something that you touch on. So if there's a different subject that you're talking about once a quarter, we could have this packaged up as part of that um, quarterly and we could have a look at it because I found the maps extremely interesting. They're very helpful and it lets all of us focus on that, the problem areas and try and communicate better to those locations. So just a thought. Absolutely. I don't see any other hands up. So I'll ask one more time, anyone else, Mary? Thanks, Sam. And thank you, Beth. That was a data geek's dream presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> so um, my question is about, um, well, way at the beginning of the presentation where um, you were saying that 75% um, of our calls are reactive and that you're targeting, I think you said something like 55 to 60%. Um, to reduce it to. And so I was curious about what the strategies would be for um, the, uh, obtaining that reduction. And then, um, yeah, that's my question. Yeah, so uh, Mary, I'm, I am really interested in doing some creative, uh, either um, looking at the program that is being run in Denver or Eugene to see if we can't get some of the medical calls or welfare checks, um, and maybe somebody is better positioned to take some of those uh, calls uh, from the police department. So I am in preliminary discussions with the fire chief and we have to see if we can start a pilot program here. But I'm really looking at these calls for service in great detail to see if the police are really needed on some of these calls. Um, I really do believe that um, we really should not be at a 75% reaction because I, I do believe that if the police do not have discretionary time to problem solve for crime prevention, to develop community partnerships, and if we're just responding back and forth to calls for service, um, that is not the intention of policing. And so um, we gotta figure it out, we gotta figure it out. And so people are doing creative things all over the country. Um, I'm very interested in um, looking at how we can um, maybe have people better equipped than us respond on some of these calls for service. Um, so all very preliminary um, and, and we just really have to understand the data much better than we do right now. But I'm gonna be looking hard at that. If that answers your question, Mary. Yeah, no, that does. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that. And then um, I had just one suggestion with respect to the updates. Um, one of the things that I notice, um, I get the emails for the community connectors weekly so that I see what they are receiving to disperse out into the community. And um, one of the things that they do really well is share infographs. So if there's like, you know, quick infographs that could be provided to like the community connectors, I think that would be um, a good way to get the information out. And, um, and also um, the stickers to give out um, to the community connectors as well. Um, but, um, but I think, you know, even I think council could benefit from quick infographs and they wouldn't have to be the entirety of the presentation, but just like bits of it here and there. Um, Cause I think that's a really good way to um, communicate data. Will do. Thank you very much. It's Mary. Great, and I guess the last thing before we move on <clears throat> is, uh, Beth, you talked about 
giving more detail about the bicycle registration plan and stickers, you don't need to do it now. But I think that is incredibly important because if we can make ourselves as a community less attractive to bike thieves, then maybe we'll have fewer coming in from outside. I mean, there have been Denver groups coming up to Boulder for decades now stealing bikes. And so if we just make it harder, if we get the word out about how to do that, I mean, I think that is a great program that will will help everyone. It'll help the people that don't get their bikes stolen and it'll help us track down the folks who are doing the stealing. So I'm really excited about that. Thank you for bringing it forward. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I see no other hands up. So with that, I'll say thank you one last time and we look forward to the next time we see some data from the police. Thanks, thanks Mayor. Yep, thank have you. a good night. Okay, Debbie. What are we doing next? We're moving on to matters from the mayor and members of council. The first item we have this evening is the city manager search update where we're uh, getting job, job profile feedback. Very good. So who's taking this to kick us off? Mary, well, do you want to get it started? Yeah, I can go ahead and get it started. Um, so Aaron and myself have been working with Jen and Jen, I um, invite you to um, chime in whenever and um, have been working with um, with Jen and um, and our consultant um, Heather Gantz on the um, job profile for the city manager so what you received in the packet was a draft um, of the profile and what we're looking for tonight from you all is um, feedback on that. And um, Jen and or Aaron, if you want to add anything. So that sums it up. So I just thought I'd jump in here. I cannot remember. Jen, have you been formally introduced to council yet? Um, yes, I believe that I have. In a Great. Mm -hmm. Good enough. So how do we want to proceed to the next step? Um, so what I would suggest would be to, um, if people have comments that um, they would like to share um, tonight um, verbally, that would be um, a good way to get things going. Um, I know that I provided edits to a first draft and um, since I've looked at the second draft, I actually have more comments, but, um, but I invite my colleagues to um, chime in. And just, just a note that I, I think we are looking for an approval, it, possibly with some amendments tonight, um, so, so that we can send this on out and move to the next phase of the recruitment. Okay, uh, I don't see any hands, so I'm gonna jump in here and just reinforce some stuff we heard from the community. Um, not only do I, I think that we want to make certain that we have a uh, expectation that whoever we hire um, will take climate change as a serious issue and you know recognize the climate mobilization action plan as a, a huge focus of community effort. So not only is it prospective that we hope that whoever we hire will do this, um, I think we need to lead much sooner than we did in the description of Boulder with that being something that's a major concern. Not only do we have all these great research institutions which are highlighted, um, many of them focus on climate change and the solutions to that. So I, I would want to not only see it as something that we hope to see from the candidates themselves, but that we would lead with. It is a, a big uh, focus of the community to start with. So even in that introductory piece, and I don't, there's a conversation to be had about whether we want to lead with how great Boulder is or follow with how great Boulder is. I, I don't know, I'm not a, a pro at this, but I would say um, I thought that was a glaring um, absence. And then the other thing I'll say is we get down to this point in this fairly glossy brochure and, and we have this reference to Bon Appetit magazine calling Boulder America's foodiest city. I'm not sure that is the most important thing or appropriate thing to, to have here. I would just comment that I found that a little bit odd and maybe even somewhat off-putting. And I guess I'll just make an overall comment 
I don't know how these kinds of position um, descriptions are normally done in this field, but I would say it, it looked kind of like a, a tourist brochure at first, and I wasn't quite sure that, you know, it just seemed a little odd to me that it didn't start out with, here's what we need, and here's what we'd love to have in candidates, and by the way, here's why you want to do all this, um, because this is a great place to work. So those were some of my major comments we heard from members of the community about the climate change issue as well. Okay, I'm still not seeing any hands. So there we go, Mary and Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will let Aaron um, go first since I have already had the opportunity to provide edits to the first draft. Uh, thank you, Mary. So, um, yeah, I think my my one point that I want to make. Well, first of all, I, th I thought it was very professionally put together, right? I mean, it's it's extremely well designed and and written and and such. So, I those, so thanks uh, to Heather and Jen for putting this together. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my my basic piece of feedback is the same bit that Sam did at the first, which is to make sure that we have something in the the job description about. Um, about the prospective city manager having a commitment to, you know, uh, combating the uh, climate crisis and and uh, a commitment to uh, working very hard to make sure that the city meets its climate goals, right? With a you know, a reference uh, uh, to our uh, the web page on that because I think that it's a specific area that we need to be uh, familiar with and and be um, committed to and probably also a mention of. Uh, that they they be up and ready for uh, the challenge of uh, implementing this new uh, partnership with Excel because I think that's going to be a substantial part of this role in the next few years is guiding that forward and, and creating it. So I think those are both important to mention in the in the city manager position. And, and I thought Sam's point was a good one as well about getting um, our commitment as a community to those issues uh, in the, the community description. Uh, also, so those would be the two things that I would put in there. Thank you, Aaron. Next, I've got Junie. Thank you, Sam. I welcome the thoughts from community members, and I do welcome adding the commitment to climate crises. But I think, as well, it is mentioned and the desired qualities and experience priorities, sustainability, and environmental stewardship. I do think that answers part of that question, but of course, I guess bringing it forward more is important. And I think there's something that was mentioned by community members as well, I think that resonate with me, this idea of having experience with the region or also having a similar experience to Boulder. I think that's very important. And I think Jane, we, we've talked, Jen, we've talked before about what I think are some of the qualities. So, but thank you for this brochure. I think it's beautiful and well-written. So thank you. Thank you, Junie. I have no other hands up. So Mary, you, you had started to say something. I don't know if you wanted to jump in here again. Yeah, I, I, I do. Um, so it's, I would agree with um, Sam's comment regarding the leading with the boulder. I did go after looking at the second draft, I took a little bit of time to look at other um, city manager profiles. In fact, um, one by Novak Consulting did not lead with, with the um, city, it led with the job description. I think it being a, um, a profile for um, a job profile that it should lead with what is expected of the person in the job rather than, um, than you know, <laughs> leading with, with uh, what would look to me like a, a convention and visitors bureau um, um, brochure. So I would put that at the end and um, tone that down some, um, I think that when um, when folks look into Boulder, they will find that out for themselves. And um, and I think 
with the limited space that we have for that um, document that we should use it to really communicate what um, the, is required of the job, what um, the policy challenges are, um, what um, the expectations of the person will be. And, um, and I agree that including um, the the ex or the the commitments that have come from the passage of the Excel franchise within the the profile, I think, will be real important, um, and as well as what our climate commitment is, because we do have a pretty um, a great climate commitment, and it centers um, equity, and I think that's a real important piece as well. So. Um, that's really all I have. Rachel, I saw your hand come and go. Thanks. I, I guess I, I would just um, say that I think when we started this process, um, I had asked Jane what her recommendation was and she said she really trusted this um, hiring firm or person. And so my inclination is to trust that they know what they're doing and if something should look glossy or not for this particular um, application process, you know, I've, I've never looked into being a city manager. So I don't know what the, what stands out and what would make Boulder look most attractive. So my, my um, inclination is to trust that they know what they're doing and that we hired them for um, a solid reason. And, and I wouldn't second guess much. Um, so I thought it looked great. Thanks. Okay, I see no other hands. And Aaron, you had hoped for a motion to approve. Um, do you think, Jen, do you think you've heard enough feedback that if we approve that you'll know kind of the changes? Definitely. Uh, so just sort of reorienting um, so that we lead with the, the job description and, and sort of end with information about the city. Um, including climate change um, in the introduction and, and really sort of highlighting um, uh, the partnership with Excel. And I, one other um, comment was about uh, the experience that's required um, for this particular region. And there's also a removal of the Bon Appetit Budius City um, <laughs> section as well. So we will we will make those edits and, and they're all very simple, straightforward edits to make. Um, and I think you can approve the position profile with that. So can I just ask that, I, I, I didn't quite follow the one about the region. What, what was the, the exact feedback you took away from that? Um, it was um, ab about having experience um, with, the, with this region. So thinking about like the, 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 the Mountain West, for example, as a region. And so during the recruitment process, um, the recruiter will source candidates from a variety of um, regions, but, but she'll also um, try to understand um, if candidates have experience in a, in a city similar to, to Boulder. So, you know, the, the, the reach and the sourcing will be pretty, pretty vast. I don't think we want to limit ourselves too much, but I think really that feedback is just to ensure that during the recruitment, we are sourcing candidates from uh, appropriate similar cities. Yeah, that, that sounds good. I just would, I think it's helpful for a candidate to have some knowledge and familiarity with the Mountain West, but you could be from a peer city somewhere else in the country that could be a great pre right. previous experience as well. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, wouldn't want to rule that out. So that sounds good the way you formulated it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's worth thinking about how to put that forward because, for instance, we fund ourselves largely with um, sales tax. And that's very unlike cities that are in the East that are almost all funded largely by property taxes. And so I, I kind of agree you wouldn't want it to be a requirement that you've done your job in the Mountain West. It might be interesting to put in there some, you know, point about knowledge about how cities operate in Colorado and how they operate in the West in general, because there are some differences. Um, but I agree, it shouldn't be 
like Aaron said, it shouldn't be kind of a showstopper or a um, filter that we keep people out. It could be something that a lot of times when I've done job descriptions, you have a, here's what we require and here are skills that are great to have. And so something that's great to have would be familiarity with Western cities and, and peer cities like Boulder. So um, if I may, I have, I have a question uh, for my colleagues, um, kind of along those lines. One of the sentences within the draft profile says that the city manager shall live in the city of Boulder. And um, connecting that to what one community member in um, the public comment today made, which was um, hire from within, um, just kind of connecting those two, thinking that, well, if we say must live within the city of Boulder and there is a good um, candidate that lives within say Boulder County or you know within the seven county region or something um, who has knowledge of the region and has some of these things that we just talked about um, but wouldn't want to move from like say I don't know, Denver to Boulder. Um, is that something that we might be open to is to just say within um, the metro area, must live within the metro area or within Boulder County, or I'm just throwing that out there um, with recognition based on um, recognition of the conversation we just had. And Mary, now that you brought that up, <clears throat> I'm going to look in the charter and see if we have a charter requirement on that. I don't know if we do, but one of the things it raised for me, I'm looking here at qualifications and it talks about city manager, or deputy city manager. Um, a lot of mayors from cities that are not um, city manager, you know, weak mayor, strong manager cities, a lot of former mayors um, might also qualify. So you say city managers, but it could be any kind of uh, city leader. There's plenty of mayors and council members um, from cities where uh, those roles are more administrative and directive, kind of like a city manager is here. So it's just a thought under qualifications. I don't know if it would help to expand to um, other roles that might prepare somebody to do a good job here. Can I make a comment in response to Mary's question? Yep. So, so when uh, when I moved here, there was a requirement that I live in the city, and I was really glad for that because it's really tempting to buy a house just outside the city because it's half as expensive, and it really is important, I think, for the lead employees to live here. Um, for Judge Cook, the council at that time did waive it because she was exactly the situation you talked about. Mary, she lives close, but she didn't live in the city, but she was already in the area and didn't want to move. So the council decided not to require her to live in the city so she could st still live in her house. So you will always have that flexibility, but I would recommend that you leave the requirement in the job description to create an expectation that the, that the lead employees in the city are going to live in the city. Great. Thank you, Tom. And now I have three hands up. I've got Rachel, Mark, and Aaron. Rachel? Yeah, yep. I, Thanks, I think it's, it, I would think it's pretty important that the, you know, given that we don't have a strong mayor system and the city manager is, is um, the one running the city in the same way that we all should be living in the city to be deciding things for the city. I think it's important that the city manager live, live here. I mean, she's the, the top executive for the city. It wouldn't, I, I think that would be very um, disconcerting for community members if it weren't somebody living here for kind of like what Tom was just saying. So I, I would be um, really resistant to that. And then just for the last conversation on um, kind of limiting or, or giving preference to people who know this region, I, I would not want to limit or even give preferential treatment to somebody who's from the county or the region or the Mountain West, because I think, um, the best candidate could be from anywhere. And also people who are from a very different system might bring the best ideas for what we could be doing better. So I, I um, would be open to innovators who don't know our systems and um, I wouldn't wanna take any steps or put anything in writing 
that limited our ability to recruit them. Thanks. Great, I've got Mark and then Aaron. Mark. Well, very briefly, I, I, I would concur with uh, Rachel. I think uh, uh, our city manager should live in the city. Uh, we can keep it as a waivable requirement if we find you know, the ultimately superior candidate who's uh, nearby. But I, I think it's important that our chief executive um, presides here. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Aaron? I was just going to say that what Mark and Rachel and, and Tom just said, so ditto. OK, very good. So unless there are other bits of input, is there a motion someone would like to make here? Sam, I'm not sure you need a motion. I think you're giving feedback to the to Jen on the description and on the thing. and. It would be really complex to put all the things that you said. I view this as a study session. I'm fine with that. It was just in the packet as a motion and Aaron had said something. So whatever, Aaron, why don't you and Mary weigh in as to what you'd like? Yeah, I think we're just looking for, I, I thought it was a motion, but I think if council just affirms, you know, that, that this is the right direction with the feedback that's given, I think that's direction is fine. Thumbs up, everybody. Are we good? All right. Super. So I think we're done then. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, Aaron and Mary for your work bringing this forward. Um, I think there's one last thing, right, Debbie? There is. It is um, item 8B, which is the bias and microaggression training reminder. Is that you, Mary? Right. Yeah, it is. It is, it's me. And um, this is just a reminder that if you haven't already signed up for uh, bias and microaggression um, sessions to please do so. I think most everybody has, a um, couple of people haven't and there's still a wide variety of um, choices. And there was an email that was sent to everybody on, let me see when that was. Um, that was Monday, um, it went out and it was the sign up sheet uh, came, went out Monday at 10, 19 a.m. and it came from Amy Kane um, and you can see what slots are still available if you have not already chosen your slots. So um, please do so. Great, thank you, Mary. Okay. Can I just note? Yeah. Sorry, Sam, but um, and I believe we agreed as a self accountability measure that we would be posting our um, attendance uh, at these trainings uh, um, somewhere on the website. So just call that out to folks that think we have that intention. Okay. Okay. So I believe we are at the end of our agenda. Um, we CAC has some work to do to reschedule the item that we punted on. Um, and I would ask if there's any other issues, any debrief of the meeting. Rachel, see your hand and Mary. I just have one question and I'm taking us back to probably last March with it. But when we met in real life, we used to have 15 people signed up for open comment and then another five, right? And I just wondered why are we at 15? instead of 20. I don't think we are, Rachel. Um, Debbie just- Oh, it was just a short a, night. Yeah, it was just a short night tonight. I believe we okay. normally do 20, right, Debbie? We do, we typically do okay. 20 and only 15 signed up this evening. Got it, thanks. Uh, Mary? Yeah, I see that Alicia Johnson is still <laughs> on the call. Okay. And I just wanted to um, her to say hi as our new city clerk. Thanks, Mary, for jumping in and, and bringing that up. Alicia has been kind of lurking here uh, for the whole meeting. We did introduce her at, at CAC on Monday. Um, but Alicia is our new city clerk. Um, she's been with the city for uh, almost eight years, I think, if I remember right. But um, um, we're super excited that she is now in the role of, of city clerk. Um, and so Alicia, I would love for you to be able to say hello. 
Oh, well, you guys are just too gracious. I so, so appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mary and Sam and Bob and the whole entire council for just welcoming me. I'm truly, truly excited for this opportunity and the confidence that Chris and Pam have shown by selecting me. I also want to give a shout out to Tom, who has been an amazing boss for the last eight years almost, and he has walked me through and helped me be successful. So I look forward to that journey with all of you, and I'm just truly excited. I've been walking around with this big, goofy smile on my face because this is, like I said in my email, my dream job, and I'm just truly, truly excited. Well, good deal. I think we're all very excited as well, and happy uh, to have you here to help guide us through the meetings. <laughs> well, thank you. Congratulations, Alicia. Yeah. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Your input and help will be essential to my success. So I look forward to getting to know all of you much better. So thank you. Super. You may not be so excited when election time comes around and the workload ramps up, but <laughs> except for well, that. On the East Coast, I, I was the election official in Jersey. We did four elections per year. Wow. We also did an individual municipal election, which is extremely challenging when you have to do all the steps. So I'm up for the challenge. Let's get it done. Very good. Very good. Awesome. Okay. Anyone else? Any other issues? Great. Seeing none, I'll gavel the meeting closed at 1045. Thank you all. Have all a good right. night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Take care.